Welcome to the Game Informer Show. I am your host, Tim Turry, today. Ben Hansen is away. Yes, uh, he is. But instead, we have Wade Wojcik. Hi. Coming down the table, we got Annie McNamara. Hello. And of course, Jeff Cork. Hi. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm touching Jeff Cork's shoulder. <laughs> Big time. It's super Because <laughs> he's sitting right next your to hand me. It's hot. It's not creepy at all. No, no. it's not. Oh, it's the just, hands off. This guy's being guys. So <laughs> thank you for listening or watching. Um, we got a good show for you. Uh, at the top of the show, we're going to talk about the new releases. We're going to have a, we're going to answer some emails. In the mm. middle segment. And then the final segment, I'm excited about this. When Ben, Han- when ben Hansen told me that we were going to be talking with Mike Drucker, I wasn't super familiar, um, but I was very pleasantly surprised. So used to be at the Nintendo Treehouse. Uh, he's a comedian who's also a writer for Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, and super funny guy. Had a really insightful Jimmy conversation. Jimmy Fallon? I'm sorry. Yeah, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The other Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, how many Jimmys are there right now? There, there are, you know... There's a lot of Jimmys. Jimmy right. Stewart? Yes. That's yes. right. Yes. Okay. But, but, but yes, but Jimmy Fallon. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so yes, Jimmy Fallon. And so yeah, he, he spent some time at the, the Treehouse. He worked on Kid Icarus Uprising and Mario 25th Anniversary stuff. Got a really insightful conversation with him about how the, the Treehouse works, which was awesome. But cool. Cool. at the top of the show, I feel like there is one big release this week, and that's destiny the taken king what yeah <laughs> you guys know anything about this game i i think i've heard of it <laughs> andy have you played any have you got a chance to play any taken king i i i have gotten i've had more taken king than sleep yeah over that's the last, a good way of putting over it over the last 48 hours yeah you streamed the taken king for seven straight hours yes you didn't move yes. from your chair did you get up no i didn't, no, get, up. didn't get up once oh my god <laughs> i did seven Not, hours no bathroom breaks no food he just sat there and played. Did you? Yeah, we did a, an awesome uh, live stream, which you can watch our yep. Twitch archive now. Yes, it's um, on our YouTube. Um, and YouTube as well. Our YouTube channel, yes. That's great. And did you beat Jeff Cork's record when we were doing our Guinness record attempt at uh, the Smash Brothers Longest Fighting Game Marathon? <laughs> yeah. Jeff Cork, how long did you, did you sit down for? How long did... Oh, this is like Embolism City. It was like... He didn't beat me. It was like 12 hours oh, or something, <laughs> something dangerous but, like... Don't do that. But he that. doesn't know. You notice that he didn't <laughs> yeah. know the answer. He's like, oh, I just, he didn't beat me. That's yeah, that's right. Right. I know that. Yeah. Like seven oh. hours is child's play. I yeah. <laughs> so what is, what is the new level cap on Taken King uh, for uh, Destiny now? 40. 40. And did you get there? Yes. You can get there in like a couple hours, um, depending on how you play. Wow. So that's not the hard part. The hard part is getting your item level up to 280, which is the new item level cap, which is the equivalent of light, what okay. it used to be. Okay, gotcha. So what, do you th- what are your overall impressions so far? Of, of Taken King. I mean, I'm really enjoying it. I mean, uh, first off, you know, with, with their 2.0 patch that led up to the launch of Taken King, they went through and they streamlined the game. I mean, yeah. like, uh, you know, a lot of things that I think, you know, all the communities and myself and a lot of people complained about were just like the UI, the way things worked, confusion about, you know, what things did, where. I mean, it, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but there was, there was a lot of confusion about the game and how it worked. And a lot of things that worked really poorly and were against the user. You know what I mean? That made things overly complicated or took way too much time for no apparent reason other right. than like Bungie just wanted to waste your time. And they fixed that, right? And and so the new UI and the new interface and the new, uh, the new just kind of overall, just the way you operate the game is so improved. Yeah. It's joy, right? Like that is yeah. amazing, right? Like right there. And then and then the Taken King content is great. So far, I've really enjoyed it. The, the, the story mode we beat in about four or five hours. But as soon as it was over, there was just all these new quests uh, that come up that I've been, I'm still working on quests from yesterday, even today. Uh, I've been exploring the Dreadnought all day today, trying to understand its kind of mysteries. Um, That's a really you cool found, space. You found your stealth drive, you got on the Dreadnought. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. I had to tell you about that. You didn't yeah, know what I you were doing. I wasn't paying attention <laughs> to the story. But, you know, so like, I, I'm having a lot of fun. And like the new weapons, you know, I'm a big fan of, I, I really think they've gotten better at making weapons. So I'm really excited that like we get to go collect new weapons. Yeah. Right? And uh, kind of with the last the last one with, with uh, House of Wolves, it was kind of like, oh, you can use all your old weapons and upgrade them and use them. And it was like, that's great. But at the same time, too, I was using weapons i'd been using for eight nine months are you talking about new we- weapon archetypes or just like new iterations on like here's the hand your new hand cannon or scout rifle well, or auto rifle well they are adding you can get a melee weapon which i have not finished farming yet i'm still farming the melee weapon oh, like beyond your knife or punch or whatever okay yeah, it's a primary weapon oh wow uh a melee 
Uh, but I haven't unlocked that yet. Uh, I need to get 25 something. Hadium flakes. Thank Hadium you. Flakes. Yeah. They, <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't yeah, know what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, Breakfast of Champions. Uh, <laughs> the uh, and and so once you get those, uh, you can ma- you can make the uh, the the primary uh, melee weapon. But I haven't done that yet. But um, no, there's no new 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 types other than that. Okay. But just like. I feel like they are always getting better at the way they design the weapons. Like even today, I was just I just started playing with the blue scout rifle that I was like, oh, it's nice and flat. I like it when they don't have too much kick. You know, like mm-hmm. not a lot of recoil. Just feels good firing. Like I can just start mowing guys down. I mean, to me, the ultimate joy of Destiny is it's fun to shoot things in the face. <laughs> the gameplay is maybe some of I don't I don't know if I can name a first person shooter that feels better off the top of my head. Like, uh, as far as just visceral gameplay. I was playing it yesterday. I realized that I grit my teeth sometimes, like, when, really? I'm, when I'm, like, getting into it. Because it's just, like, when you shoot that guy and line it up, and the way, like, the muzzle flashes and the kick yeah. feels, like, it's it feels good. It feels great. Yeah. I, I mean, I think in the console space, there is no, I think there's none better, in yeah. my opinion. I think the Halo uh, 5 beta played really well. It was tight. Uh, and the abilities are similar, you, but now they had the thrusting. Did you play the Halo 5 beta? I, I played a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I, play, I, I played mostly just, well, I mean, it's just multiplayer, so I just ran yeah, around and yeah. shit, you know, so it's, like, it's Kind of hard to it's kind of hard to judge. I think overall, yes. as far as like saying like where mm-hmm. Halo Five falls, as yeah. far as that goes, and they even they even said they were making some changes from beta, right, going forward. So I wanted to yeah. see what those changes are going to be. Actually, I did get to play that on the cover story. Oh, uh, okay. Well, oh, look at you. <laughs> uh, just real quick, I want to say that the sprinting um, is a little less agile. You, it takes you a second to start up sprinting. That's one change from beta. Uh-huh. So that's not quite as fluid. Uh, but I will say that Halo is a, a probably Halo Five is probably a close second to okay. Destiny's look and feel. I think it still does play a little better. So well, they they definitely share a pedigree, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I mean that's not exactly right. shocking news. <laughs> but you were saying so it's a scout right? Like a, it was a blue scout rifle, and you were falling in love again with the gunplay. Yeah, I mean, I just and the thing is too this this go. Like one of my favorite things in the original game, one of the things that just you kind of like fell upon was like you'd be in a zone like on patrol, and then all of a sudden it'd be like the two sides are attacking, or there'd be like a little yeah. emo would come and you're like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden like these big wars would break out yeah. out of nowhere, and they've kind of been playing on that, riffing on that with the expansion, like trying to adding new things in, like oh okay, then we'll have uh, some hive kind of appear here, and you can go fight them, mm-hmm. and then they kind of move forward with that. And this one. The Taken are landing all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like weird, there's... like black hole monsters. They're like weird iterations of the creatures from from like the core Destiny. It's game. from the core game, yeah. yeah. And so like they're kind of takes on that. So there's like mm-hmm. you'll run into Minotaurs that are Taken Minotaurs. There's there's the there's like the the golems which do like these weird. They make like a doppelganger that's like you can't yeah. kill. Yeah. Like you're about to kill it, and it's like one of those blobs from old school games where it's just like you kill it, and it's just like blah, and it just seems to split into two or something. I, it, it, trust me, there's madness. Yeah. There's a lot there's it's like cool. the, the hob the hobgoblins shoot these like three like kind of grenade launcher yeah. missile launcher things at you that Ugh. you're like it's like a whole new like mechanic you got to deal with there are these guys that do this thing that i basically call the death blob which when it hits you it makes you blind it <laughs> the, takes like the three fallen captains do that yeah and yeah. it's it's and it's cool to like dodge those things and it just changes the way the game plays and so those guys appear out of the nowhere all the time. And then, of course, mm-hmm. in, in a lot of the zones I've been in, I've had this kind of like, I call it Super Saiyan mode when like everything goes crazy and like all the guys just start coming out of the spawn yeah. spots and fighting and like you're stuck in the middle and they just keep like getting harder and harder. That's been happening to me a lot. So it's been madness. And like, I, I kind of like the madness, right? And so, and I really enjoyed, I got through all the strikes last night. Uh, I was up till three o'clock in the morning, got through all those. Oh, so wait, hold on a second. You streamed <laughs> for seven hours and then went home, and how much time was passed between you and p- picking back up again? I had to drive home and <laughs> grab dinner, so about 45 minutes before I got <laughs> oh back my on. Oh, God. Yeah, so I played a lot yesterday, 13, 14 hours, something how, like that. How are the strikes? I, I like them a lot. The, uh, yeah. the new strikes are, are, are great. There's one... I, I, this, okay, I was a little wacky, so I'm not going to be able to tell you the name of the strike in particular. And the strikes are the three-player ones, right? Uh, yes. Raids are six. Yeah, okay, yeah raids gotcha. are six. Okay. And this strike, basically, when you got to the last boss, he creates these barriers on the walls. And at first, you think it's, you think it's like just a classic Nexus run. And then he comes out into the room, and you're like, okay, he's in the middle of the room. That's bad. And then these walls start moving, and you have to grab the ball, which he's protecting, like so you kind of like have to like have one of your people like kind of 
get his attention. Then you okay. run up and you steal the ball, and then you run it to the other side and you put it in its place. And then he opens up this like kind of diamond shielding that he has, and then he starts to come after you. And then you can shoot him during that one so period. You, you have to steal the ball to unlock his vulnerable point. Correct. Wow. Okay. But then the walls start moving and closing in on you, and like moving back and forth, like while you're trying to fight this guy, and like he's he's, he's pretty mean. And okay. then there's like then ads start coming, and it just madness. And it was really fun. And then there's the Smash Brothers guys, or the the, the <laughs> Bond Brothers, which there's these two like robot guys come out, and they're like one guy shoots these missiles in the air, the other oh, guy. Oh, the Cabal Brothers. Yeah, the Cabal yeah, Brothers. Oh, yeah, yeah, super the, Cabal yeah. Bros. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And they they come after you. That and one's they, fun. Yeah. That's a really fun. Uh, that's a really fun Wait, map. They're, they're throwing um, hammers. You said. No, they weren't throwing hammer. But oh, okay. we, we kind of joked that they okay. were. They, uh, we thought of Super Mario, That's obviously. Good. Uh, and well, so, that was cool because one comes out, you fight him, and he has his own special things. Then he goes away. The other one comes out, you fight him, and then they both come out together in his dual chaos. It's sort of like a Dark Souls fight. They throw two, yeah, two dudes so, at you, two bosses at mm -hmm. once. I've really enjoyed the design so far. There was a third. There was a third uh, strike I did that had like basically I kind of made a portal joke I think during the thing. But it's like there were all these like electricity things going off. So there was like all these like traps going along the sides, like trying to kill you while this big tank dude tried to kill you and it was really fun as yeah. well so thus far like all the tank all the fights i've had have not been like you know they were kind of accused in the early game of making a lot of just bullet sponges mm -hmm. like uh, like guys who just like the first make... like crab tank thing that you'd fight oh, oh yeah oh yeah. ballast to arc was the, the first, worst you just go yeah. and then walk to the other side and then go and then yeah. walk to the other side mm -hmm. no like these are way way better fights way more entertaining and even when i went and did old strikes the Taken had had invaded these old strikes. All of the old strikes. So I don't know really? if it's all of them okay. yet. I mean, all it was right. just like, I was just cruising around going like, oh, Hamdi Dam, I know exactly what I'm doing. I've done this thing 50 times. And I was like, wait, okay, this is different. All right, hold on. Yeah. You know, we got to do this. So Because I know there's a logo on the map uh, that's a special logo that's above some of the existing areas, which sometimes hints on whether or not there's, like the Taken have affected, or that expansion has affected this area. Is are the Taken affecting areas that don't even have like that that logo on it at all or that little symbol? I mean, I've seen them everywhere. Yeah, I, I okay. can't think of a place I haven't seen them. And okay. I mean, I think there are some people who might be like, oh, you're, I mean, I am going to places I've been, Yeah. right? You know, the Dreadnought is certainly new, but I mean, I'm going to the moon, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I'm going to the Cosmodrome. Even that second mission, yeah, you go to the Cosmodrome, but then it's like you're being led through this to this new area of the Cosmodrome and it, it unlocks this, it seems like you went to this new area with like the, this crane and stuff like that. Yeah. That I don't the colony remember, ship. I don't remember that being in the, it's not, the, the it's core not, game. And yeah. it's kind of cool to go back yeah. and find a new spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they've added to it. Mm -hmm. and, and just the fact that they've changed things up. And, and in, in particular, some of the old like maps, like people would like they would quit out and not finish them because they were too long. Mm -hmm. And some of those in particular, they changed entirely, like not just added taken, but got rid of giant sections that were just they just made the they made the strikes take 45 minutes or an hour. So they just tightened it up a bit. Yeah, and so they got them down to where like they're more like 30 minutes is kind of a max, which mm -hmm. I think is, is much because like there's sometimes you're like, oh no, I don't want to do this. You're like, no, I think they changed it. Let's go ahead and like okay, you know, ride it through. Um, and so uh, you know, thus far I've been, I've been, I've been very, very impressed. I mean, I think I think they're doing a really great job of like listening to the feedback from the players. Doing what they do well and continue to do what they do well and improve upon that and and just kind of wrap it into a package that I think is like much more like there are more people who will enjoy this one I think than than did the original year one and a lot of people loved year one by the way and, myself included and that's the that's the angle I'm coming from like if you're listening to this or watching this like Andy's enthusiasm is obvious and also that's the sort of enthusiasm that's come through for the last year from when you hear Destiny players and Destiny fans like talk amongst each other like you know you and Miller will go off. Yeah. And I feel like in the time that I spent playing Taken King last night, it's I started to understand. Um, like, obviously, I had to start off and get leveled up to 25 and go talk to like a million people. Uh, but then once I finally did my first, you know, it was like, I was kind of disappointed because I'm like, okay, well, now I could just truck through all these old level two story missions. But then I realized that, okay, the Taken King levels have unlocked. And it's 25, you level up to 25, it's perfect. You have all this awesome gear. I have this this gold uh, like hand cannon. And I didn't used to play with the hand cannons. I switched over to a warlock. I'm like, yeah. I might as well start a new character. And I'm happy I did because warlock, I started a blade dancer. And like the sort of, what is it called again? Is it the fury mode or the um, the super? Your super yeah, charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, the warlock used to be like sort of this flaming pistol. You'd get like these three really oh, powerful. The hunter. Was that the hunter? I'm yeah. oh, sorry, yeah, I'm the hunter. That's the, that's the <laughs> I'm the gun. hunter. Thank yes, you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's what's played. That's suited me more. And so I switched over to the blade dancer style, and like it's like the opposite, where you used to shoot these projectiles, and it used to be like the satisfying limited amount of you know you get three shots, choose them very carefully. Now with the blade dance, it's like you're 
I always get in there more. And you just turn into this crazy, like, just blade wielding maniac, and you're just like one shotting everybody. Uh, you yeah. just encouraged to get in there, and and then also just the pacing of the Taken King's first mission, first couple missions anyway. Mm-hmm. Like where people talked about the original Destiny kind of getting off to this, it's kind of a subdued start in a way. I'd say, um, just things are exploding, the Taken are invading. Um, you're you're seeing just black holes ripping apart the environment, <laughs> uh, and then you know you'll see these remixes of uh, the uh, the um, God. What were you saying? The name of the the guys with that the big guys, the elephant dudes. You'd blow their the heads cabals. off the cabals, yeah. and, and and then you'd see like the cabals. the dust spray out of their heads. You know, there used to be the phalanx version of them, and they'd pull up their shield. But now that doesn't mean that you know you're supposed to. You should take cover because they like fire this weird blast out of yeah, their shield. Yeah, they blow you yes, back. It's it will tear you out, tear you apart or, or blow you off the ledge. Yeah. Anyway, the Taken King in the first several hours I've played of it is I finally feel like I'm I'm getting it. It feels really good, and the quest system, like just knowing where to go, is it's such so a much better. Small thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's part of the changes that came in with 2.0, yeah. and it's just it, and you can keep a much more robust quest log. Mm-hmm. Like I I there, in the past, you really like it was like. You still kind of fight with the vault space a little bit, but you're always fighting with like your inventory. And right. no one loves like, hey, do you want to play the new inventory game I made? Right. And right. like that was a lot of Destiny Year One. Do you want to do the like, hey, which quest are you gonna do? Which one are you gonna forget? Which one are you gonna deal with? Like it just that management stuff is is pretty well. It's not eliminated, but it's much improved. Yeah, they've they've gone a long ways with that. And it's it's I feel like it's really it's sort of reassuring because the the conversation around Destiny started out where it's just kind of like, oh, you like Destiny? Like, what are you doing? This game, this weird game, there's no <laughs> now, story in that's here. That's the like, way other people talked about it. Well, right, not not <laughs> you, but like, it just felt like there was, it was very polarizing. And, but at the same day, like, at the same time, I wanted to kind of have as much fun as you guys were having. I felt like, ah, it's kind of alienating. It's just kind of like, I want to know what they're seeing in it. And I feel like people that were maybe feeling burned or, or sort of not into the core Destiny experience and, if you're willing to give Taken King a chance, I think it starts off on a super strong first st- step, and I'm I'm feeling sold again. Like I feel like I'm playing the game that I kind of imagined to begin with. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Especially oh like Cade, like uh, is it Cade <laughs> Cade six? Cade six. Or, Cade yeah. six. Nathan Flynn's the fact character. that he even remember a character's name from Destiny now, let alone like him, right? Uh, <laughs> that says a lot for what the exactly. the new direction of this yes. of this expansion. Mm-hmm. So plus yeah. how he kind of pokes fun at Eris's somber, dark demeanor is he, great. He's basically the audience. He's sort of yeah. like the eye yeah. rolly kind of like, uh, can you get a load of this this sci fi universe of <laughs> taking it really seriously? He's he's super charming. That's yeah. against type for Nathan Fillion. Be like a, <laughs> yeah. a wise cracking rogue. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. He <laughs> must have like ex- loved that. Jeff to explore new territory. Yeah, I know he's really branching out. Did, do you feel like, from what you've learned about Taken King and what you've played of the original Destiny, do you feel like you're you're willing to give it another shot? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm kind of glad to hear your side of it because I know like yeah. Andy yeah. was enthusiastic about it from like the get go. Yes. And like I played it and I was excited for like a while, but after a while it just kind of dropped off my interest did. And you maintained that that interest. And so I'm kinda like I'm excited to hear like someone who was kind of felt about the same way about Destiny as I did yeah. and how you're looking at it. So And we'll so- both be like level twenty five if we start, so maybe we can run around together. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's and, and then the new classes, by the way, to point out, you know, the the Night Stalker, mm-hmm. which is like the third subclass for Hunter, um, is I've been exploring that quite a bit, and I really like the new class, and it's fun leveling up the subclasses again. Kind of lets you build up through the talent tree and unlock new talents. And you know, I I kind of laugh at the beginning of the game, and one of my favorite parts of the game, and you'll appreciate this, Jeff, is like at the early part of the game when you're like really getting like new gear all the time, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm still in that. I mean, I, like I said, I'm 13 hours in. Oh, maybe oh God, I might be 16 hours in now. I'm still going back to the tower, which is much like going back to the town in Diablo. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like, man, you're like, oh, okay, let's go see what we got. Oh, I got these. I got these. And like, mm-hmm. I'm going to read this. And I'm going to go put this in my bank. And then I'm going to go turn in this quest. So I'm going to go ahead this. You know, like, just, I let, if you play Diablo, mm-hmm. you know how fun it is to go back to the town. The loop, oh, yeah. Like, that loop is strong. And, yeah. And yes. just like, just get your loot, figure out what you got. What are you going to do next? How are you going to level that up? Where are you going to take that? Like, what's it going to be? Like, that game is on right now, and it is really fun. And I and it and it and I think that you know, with leveling my night soccer, with getting new gear, and even trying to figure out what the gear is, because I've I've got purples in like most of my slots, and I was like, okay, I've got to figure it out. This is a level forty purple. I'm pretty good in this slot. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, like earlier today, I got this blue that was better, and I right. was like, 
Oh no. Have I been throwing away blues that I shouldn't be throwing away? You know what I mean? Like, just like, so then all of a sudden I was like, well then anything's possible. And so like, you know, just like trying to figure out like what all the loot is and what its values are. And, uh, so there's a lot of fun in just like the loot game right now. And, you know, for anyone else, like when you talk about, you like the hunter, the great thing so far is, is the night stalker class feels really different. It doesn't feel like, like, Oh, uh, I'm I'm Golden Gun, kind of a weird mix with uh, Blade Dancer. Was it's, the Blade Dancer from a previous expansion or a previous no? The, DLC? the original game gave you two subclasses, okay, right? So Blade Dancer's old. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, you still shoot things, right? I mean, yeah. there's always the core mm-hmm. Destiny feeling, but like, it's an interesting class. I really like the way that I'm, I've been using the bow more often, the way it traps and kind of like manipulates things. You were unsure about it at first. I wasn't sure about it at first, and I wasn't really sure too. That I have a weird like my melee thing. You asked me about it, I think during the stream, and I was like, yeah. "You're crazy." It's just I'm just punching things with my knife like normal, <laughs> and you really don't. It does have a new like uh, it has a melee attack that's like this little grenade that oh, I okay. throw. Oh, weird. That I've been trying to figure out like what that does too. Are you a hunter too? Then is that your? Uh, that, I, I play the hunter as my main, but I, okay. I've leveled all all three. I maxed out. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. prior and I, i'm really looking forward to playing the warlock because they have kind of this just like emperor palpatine like you know, yeah you know, just electric awesome. storm That's and great. like uh vinny my friend who i was streaming with he was playing it last night and he's just like it's really fun you know what <laughs> i mean and i was like okay i'm looking forward to that and, and uh and then we were playing on some of the uh we were you know we had a pickup guy would be our third mm-hmm. when we were doing the strikes and we did a number of them with the titan which was like things would get a little hairy and then like the Titan would come running in just throwing throwing oh, t- uh, like, the, like those hammers that's everywhere the, and you're the, like, okay, that's pretty cool. That's the new thing for the for the, the Titan. Yeah, the yeah that's, their new, that's yeah. their new subclass. Yeah. Okay. So like, you know, the subclass is at least, you know, I can only speak to the one so far. I like the way it feels. It feels different. It's giving me some different tools to make the character a little bit more interesting, even mm-hmm. if you're just going to level the hunter. But, you know, for people like myself that are going to end up leveling like all three and getting all the subclasses up and seeing how they go. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited to see all those those other subclasses, which, you know, I think one of the questions we got yesterday was like, oh, is it worth forty dollars? It's like I I'm pretty much guaranteed 60 hours, pretty much just at oh, a yeah. base level. And I'm going to crush that. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I see from what I've done so far with the Hunter. I mean, I see myself easily putting a couple hundred hours into this game. Mm-hmm. And with the raid coming out on Friday. Yeah, um, sorry, yeah, I know. He's checking the watch to make my, sure that my, we're ready for my, when the raid comes out. <laughs> my Apple Watch is going crazy, uh, but yeah, when that comes out, it's going to even just totally add to that sixty hours already. Yeah, if you know, honestly, it seems like the that forty dollars price point is to me. I, I did get some enjoyment out of the Core Destiny, and if you think about how tapped in Bungie must have been to that community, and you know, during our cover story trip, uh, from what I gathered is that they no one's paying more attention to the feedback than than Bungie is, and it just feels like this direct, really thorough response and like a really strong turnaround on the level of maybe something like you mentioned Diablo three before, like they mm. turned that ship around mm-hmm. in a crazy way. Uh, Square Enix with like a Realm Reborn, it seems like they took that stuff really seriously and and doubled down on it because they believe in this. And it's coming through even really early in Taken King. Uh, so I'm excited to keep going on that. Yeah, right away from the first mission, it's like action-packed and throws you right in the action. It mm-hmm. reminds me a lot of the old Halo levels. Like yeah. Like Halo 3 a lot and, and some of Reach as well. That's definitely what I thought of. And it really showcases how amazing those visuals are. Um, have you jumped into Crucible stuff at all? Is uh, I have done the new like kind of, a, I think it's Relic, which okay. is the new like a kind of Capture the Flag game. I've okay. played that a little bit. Uh, that came out with 2.0, so it came mm-hmm. out the week before. Uh, I haven't gone into all the new maps. I mean, I mean that's the other thing. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff to do there, right? Uh, and I I, uh, I look forward to do, to doing that. I'm still just kind of trying to focus on PVE right now, right. which is just kind of crazy. Um, but uh, and you know, I I could go online and probably read more about how everything works. But I, I kind of like exploring and figuring out what all the kind of tools yeah. are. And mm-hmm. so like right now I'm really enjoying like I know crucibles run around like shoot each other in the face learn the maps <laughs> right. learn you know that's learn, what it is for you <laughs> yeah learn learn where the heavy ammo is and get better right uh, but I think uh, in the case of like the world like the dreadnought right now is the most interesting thing to me because I, I, there's like chests that are locked and I've been finding these keys and I've been finding these other like consumables where did you had. find the keys I, I I gotta know I found them off some cabal I killed like which <laughs> like a yellow and then. And then I've been getting these like kind of like one usage consumables that are that I don't know what they do yet kind of thing. And then I found this I got this rare crystal that I had to bring back to Aerith. And then she was like, 
Well, it was one of the. This was actually a lame question. I was like, "Here, I brought this to you," and she's like, "Great, go get me five more." And I was like, "Ah, ah one of those." Uh, and I was like, "You got this, me. You were doing so good on quests, and then you gave me this one." <laughs> uh, and and so I, I've been trying to to figure that place out, and it's big and it's confusing. And even right when you came up and said, "Andy, it's time to do the podcast," I was like, "There was a mission I'd been waiting kind of an hour to get, and it popped up right then." And then I grabbed it, <laughs> and then I went down, and then I was like, I took a turn, and I was like, "Where am I going?" And I was like, "Whoa, there's this whole new area under here That's awesome. that I had not seen before." So. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really enjoying exploring the dreadnought. Uh, before we move on from Destiny, I have one question. As someone who did not complete all of the content from, you know, the, the core Destiny game or you know, House of Wolves and all that stuff, what after I get through the Taken King content, you know, what are my options? Is the idea that I'm going to have a that other number? that says that the mission's impossible. Like, in the core Destiny game, you could change the difficulty of an older quest to bump it up, get more experience from it, make it harder. Um, you know, is that how I'm going to go back and experience old story content is through... Is that my light level? Is that what that is? You know, that's not as important now. I mean, I think what you'll do after the game is there are there are you know after you finish the core content, mm-hmm. there are there are quests they're going to send you out that have really cool missions okay. that are going to give you an opportunity to get a legendary item. Okay. They're going to s- simply say like your reward here is like get a legendary piece of armor or get a legendary weapon, okay. be it primary. Uh, special or uh, you know heavy. Okay. Uh, and so you'll be like, you know, it, it's kind of in that same like, you know, you want to build up your paper doll kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? And some people do, and some people don't. Like I like, I like leveling up that stuff and getting better gear, and that's really what your goal is at that point. And so then you'll start the kind of classic in that same Diablo kind of sense, MMO sense. You'll start the farm, which will be the raid, which mm-hmm. will be, hey, I want this weapon. Hey, I want to try to get uh, exotics, which you know it's going to take a while. I I didn't have enough eye level yet. I thought to 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 complete well the, the weekly heroic okay. strike uh but there's also the nightfall strike which is even harder than that which i don't even want to think about <laughs> trying right now because they're gonna be level 42 uh, and i'm level 40 and so that means we've got to be pretty strong to deal okay. with that so it's getting to that then it's like starting to farm the uh, the exotics the new exotics what's coming down the pipe so it's kind of like it, it's definitely like you you need to you need to love like getting gear and trying to get mm-hmm. gear and that satisfaction that comes from it um but like you know, yesterday during the stream, I got a hawk moon for like I've been trying to get that thing for a year, and I like nonchalantly walked up to a vendor and he gave me freaking hawk yeah. moon. And I was your like, karma. I was like, <laughs> what is hawk yeah, moon? What's, what kind of gun is it? It's a it's a it's a pistol. I mean, okay. it doesn't. It's it's kind of crap right now because it's a year one mm-hmm. exotic. Okay. I really could have used it like six months ago. Of course, but it did complete my collection nice. of kind of those. So I, I was excited about that. Um, and, uh, and, and it does enable me now to, I can buy the year two one with legendary marks, which I think is 150 marks, Mm -hmm. which I'm at like 80, I'll probably in today at maybe another, you know, maybe close to 150. So I can buy the year two version, which will be a really powerful, handy weapon to have. But you kind of want to be careful with how you spend those marks too. You you do. But I mean, like, I, I mean, like for me right now, I never, I never spend marks on armor. I will always wait to get armor to drop for me hmm. it's just my own strategy so you're getting some strategy hints here okay. from uh <laughs> Pro tips. from me on this and that you know weapons are weapons change to me weapons change the value of the game more than anything else like armor certainly stops things from killing you but like i can dodge better right right i can i cannot suck as a hunter yeah you can yeah. dodge oh 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 leave me alone titan you have plenty <laughs> of things to not get hurt uh so i like you know i i always try to focus on buying early on like really upping my weapons getting my damage up is what i tend to focus on okay and so like i, I have no problem with buying uh, a main hand weapon though the only problem with buying a main hand weapon right now as an exotic which is i'm getting pretty deep on this stuff is that it will not have like a uh, void fire or solar i should say um, or arc damage on it, which is really nice to have those on the weapons because because it's kind of a, a weapon reset for the game overall. Guys with shields are really hard again. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're really hard again, which is fun. I mean, that's that, that's why I'm really enjoying year two. Okay, everything that was fun at the beginning of year one that was really hard, that was crazy, and like I couldn't beat, I now get to climb that hill again. Uh, so from what it sounds like is you know if if people are coming back. And they, you know, are going to boost up to twenty five. That they can go back, enjoy some of those strikes and raids from the the past content, uh, and play those again to get some better better gear as well. It's set up to come back at any at any level. You to can start again at level one, and you get to do the kind of new streamlined yeah. overall mm-hmm. storyline, which yeah. I did part of it before the game okay. came out. You can come in at twenty five. A friend of mine joined me today when I was playing here at the office. He got from twenty five to twenty eight, and like. 
an hour. Okay, not bad. We were having a lot of fun, you know, shooting stuff. You and you know, he I was level forty, he was twenty five, but we were still able to do things together. It was great coming in at thirty four. Yeah, you know what I mean. Get in there, start start the start the missions and get going. There's there's plenty to do. I mean, right. there's plenty to shoot. There's plenty of crazy action. Plenty going of guys on. to shoot in the face. Yeah, <laughs> I've been having a good time with it. So don't be afraid uh, if 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 you didn't like the core game. I'm, I can't wait to go back to it. I just wish it was. Not among so many amazing games. Like I feel like right now, I all I want to do is play Metal Gear Solid Five. Yep. And then also make Super Mario levels. Like it feels like a really weird time to be playing video games because mm -hmm. playing an open world Metal Gear game that's good. Yep. And creating custom, creating and sharing custom Mario levels, like that is those are two weird things to be happening simultaneously. I feel like it's a crazy world. It's a crazy, crazy world. A crazy right Mario now. world we live in. Yeah. Cork, I know that you've been, you know, obviously Kyle Hilliard uh, reviewed the game. We were able mm -hmm. to post that a while ago. Uh, he gave it a nine. He loved it. Um, and then now more of us have gotten a chance to see what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And I've fallen madly in love with it. Yeah, I've been having a great time with it, too. I've been playing it with my kids, which it's interesting because they never played Mario, really. Right. And I get whatever so you're a bad dad basically i'm a terrible <laughs> parent I, like i know it's like i'm losing gamer cred or whatever like because i'm supposed to have started them out on that and <laughs> moved in this very specific order of games before but, you feed them yeah before i right. feed them yeah, exactly or during their first feeding and, and you feed them only TV. mushrooms yeah exactly. <laughs> but you know one thing i was worried about with mario maker was the blank page syndrome where you sit down and it's like i'm gonna write a novel and it's yeah. like well i'm just staring at a word doc this is terrifying chapter one but why would i ever doubt Nintendo for that because they're amazing at like maybe to a fault sometimes they like to parse out content like you look oh, at Splatoon God. or something like that where they're sort of artificial means for for time like drip feeding content mm -hmm. in the case of Splatoon people were like this there's not enough here yet I like it give me more but in the case of something like Mario Maker it seems to work really well because it's like all right you got some you got piranha plants you got Goombas and, and Koopa Troopas and you have wings see if you what happens when you attach those to piranha mm -hmm. plants they give you a limited set of tools within Mario 1 to experience experiment with right and then they let you switch to new Mario Bros and then once you unlock that like they'll tell you it's adorable like a little pickup truck shows up it goes beep beep there's a new delivery coming tomorrow mm -hmm. you'll get the underwater stage lo and behold you spend another 45 minutes or an hour just kind of tinkering around with the overworld stuff or I'm sorry the above ground stuff yeah uh, like oh that shipment's early Go ahead and play around with it. So you kind of earn your your new tools and levels by by proving that you've kind of come to understand stuff. And I was surprised. Like you'll just it'll be like I like pipes a lot, and I like uh, piranha plants. Like okay, I'll make a whole stage about this, mm -hmm. and it just kind of flows out of you because you like the language of the this, pipes and piranha plants. <laughs> they come out, right out of you. Right I'm they overflowing right with yes. them. Yes. Uh, but it's just it was really surprising because it's like a language that everybody knows. A visual language and a gameplay mm -hmm. language, so you know just by looking at it what would be difficult. And uh, I it, find that it is very annoying to me for that same reason. Okay. It's kind of like a language you're familiar with. You know what? Here's a new typing thing. I'm gonna give you the space bar and the letter E. Have fun. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I get it. I'm familiar with this. And then, hey, maybe um, we'll give you another vowel. In Caps lock. K. Tomorrow. So you just want all of it. You want to be. Like well, I don't want all of it, but like, sandbox. like I'm, I, I sit there and I'm playing with the kids and like they enjoy this super limited palette at the very beginning because, you know, Mario, whatever. And I'm like, I have they're like, you should make a level. I'm like, cool. I'm going to make something. I've got something in my mind. I've been thinking about it. Let me go through. Oh, no, I don't have platforms that I can move yet. Um, I don't have this. I don't have that. All I see is like the stuff I don't have. And in the meantime, I'm like, well, I guess I can make some tricky jumps and I'll put some wings on a Goomba. That's great. And admittedly, I have not spent a ton of time with it. I've, I've probably sat down for a couple of hours, okay. but it seems like even then I'm not getting the stuff. And it's frustrating because you play those Nintendo courses that they've made, and I feel like by playing them, I should be... I feel like they owe me something. Sure, you've proven having, you know how these things work. Yeah, it seems like... A, to me, I would prefer, like, each level that Nintendo makes is kind of based on a gimmick. Like, hey, here's some music note blocks, you know, okay. from Mario 3 or whatever. After I beat that level... Even make me go into the edit mode and move things around for a minute, but then give me that new stuff. Okay, that's how I'd prefer rather than I. The delivery truck, the sound effect is very cute, and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like I would just rather have the stuff. Okay, you see, because like for me, you know, with like something like Little Big Planet, mm -hmm. I felt really overwhelmed. And, I understand that too, and stuff like so. that. And so it's interesting to get a different perspective on that. Uh, I would trade. Honestly, though, it's like you have the new Super Mario Brothers and you have the classic Mario Brothers. Give me everything from the original Super Mario Brothers. 
And you could just leave that new Super Mario there's, stuff. There's just, so much to just do. Just abandon it. I haven't even gotten to Mario 3 or Mario World stuff, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of intimidated by that because, like, that gets complicated. Mario, th- Mario World, like, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of weird secret keys and stuff. And, yeah. And ghost houses with multiple exits, and people have gotten intricate. If you go in mm-hmm. and look at Mario Maker, they have a lot of stuff where it's just like, hey, don't touch anything. And, and it's just sort of like a Rube Goldberg device, which is fun. There's some really clever levels, like uh, one where you're playing as Bowser on his way to go get Peach or something. Or <laughs> there's an amazing one on, on uh, you can check on the, I think it might still be on the, well, it's on Game Informer for sure. We basically, it's one that is aimed to make Waluigi like yeah, I saw reflect that. on his, his own existence. That's crazy. It's like a Silent Hill Mario thing. It's just like Waluigi, yeah. this is your heart and it points to a pile of bones and like no amount of <laughs> yeah. coins will replace the void. As and you're running along, like it spells it out in coins. Yeah. It's like I don't your want, existence is worthless It's or great. <laughs> I don't want to give it all away, but yeah. it's, there's some amazing trolley levels in there. There's like a Super Meat Bros level in mm-hmm. there, which uses the wall jumps of the new Super Mario Bros. Mm-hmm. It does um, really like I... The kids were playing. I came down and to see how they were doing, and they were like, "We had to skip a level because it was too scary." And I was like, "What are you talking kids about?" Kids are scared of ghost houses and castles. Well, there's like some like effects, like <laughs> like telephone ringing. And oh like yeah, yeah. Heartbeat sound effects it is. and stuff like that. It's spooky. That, like, it, I guess if you're a little kid, yeah. I mean, but I can see that. <laughs> no, I was legitimately terrified. Yeah. <laughs> you, you Give me so much. Yeah. I, um, and no, he's having a good time. No, it's I all, got Jeff basically said like, "Hey, if you're stupid, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're a kid. I, <laughs> if you're like a yeah, little baby, whatever, uh, a diaper baby." No, honestly, that, it's a total aside. But like, my my nieces and nephews like are creeped out by castle levels. I don't know if it's the yeah. skeletons in the organ music, but anyway, regardless, the whole experience of like getting on Twitter and sharing levels and getting feedback, and then someone was like vining them trying to beat my level like across the country and wow. and then they finally like all i heard was just like them swear at the end of the vine and i was like yeah <laughs> and uh and then they finally beat it and just like that sensation that people are playing something that you created and then yeah. f- you're getting this instant feedback and they're rating it and it's just like i don't know like i know that that's probably what little big planet and creating in these games that have enabled that share creating and sharing stuff um has has felt like but it's just it's different with mario they make it a lot easier to check out that user content yeah. too because it's just like i just throw a bunch of levels at me i don't want to have to like you can browse mm-hmm. you can do things that kind of stuff or you could just say take me to a bunch of random yeah. levels and some of them are just absolute garbage correct but they're over super quickly it's true uh and you know if you're curious in checking out my levels or uh i know brian shea's got some levels up uh i'll put in a link to uh on, on the page for this podcast so if you want to mm-hmm. check out some of our mario maker levels give us some feedback make some of your own and, and shoot them at us we're going to try to play some community levels and yeah that record some video of us checking them out so um so besides that i want to take a quick detour uh into dark souls land um so we got some access to uh the tgs build of the game it's essentially this uh so this is dark souls 3 it's essentially the same area and enemies and bosses that we saw the gamescom build but we got to check out the magic a little bit Mm -hmm. so just to kind of paraphrase all of that uh magic seems easier to use in dark souls i know i think i'm looking at a bunch of folks that aren't super you guys aren't huge dark souls fans i think some of you came around on bloodborne a little bit but Mm -hmm. basically to set it up uh dark souls has got a cryptic magic system so far if that's uh comes as any surprise there's something cryptic in that game yeah (laughs) it was weird uh well, ah, basically, ah. it was it was really strange uh, based on like you know what what how much you had to level up something, and it was based on a charge system um, for each spell, and it's a little more straight more straightforward. You know that you how you recover f- health from drinking out of a flask, your yeah. Estus flask, and it refills at a bonfire. You have an MP bar now. You have a flask for your MP bar called the Ash Estus flask that refills when you sit down there uh, and go to a checkpoint or mm-hmm. whatever. So it's really straightforward that way. And um, there's just some there's some cool spells like uh, a giant like soul great sword that like you know even if you don't use a great sword you create this giant magic sword that takes a big big swipe or these fast little magic darts um, makes a lot of sense um, it feels really good so I'm excited I was already excited for Dark Souls three because it feels faster it's a little bit more like Bloodborne in the way like the pace of combat how f- how speedy it is mm-hmm. and as someone who always just focused on melee combat the fact that magic seems a little bit more straightforward like. I'm enticed by that Mm -hmm. and it adds more ranged gameplay into it. So that is something to look forward to. Um, But besides that, like the other thing that people seem to be talking about constantly uh, in this office is the continuing saga of Metal Gear Solid. That's all I want to do is play that. (laughs) And I could not be more surprised. Like I never thought that like Metal Gear five, solid five. I was like, Oh, it's coming out this year, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like didn't watch trailers for it unless i had to and right just, it wasn't like i hated it or that it was gonna be terrible or anything it's just not 
particularly interested in it. Right. And it's all I want to do is play that. Have you gotten all I do is think about it. Jeff, Jeff, can you can you attach balloons to tanks and and take them off of the battlefield yet? Yeah, it's the best. How about the first time you like you were able to do that? Like it was this is a mission that I did where I may not have even had that ability yet, Mm -hmm. but I had to uh, stop a caravan and or a convoy or whatever and um, and go and steal a vehicle. And if I hadn't had this ability yet, I would have had to have just like take out these tanks, jump in this truck and drive it off of the map out of the mission zone while I was being chased, presumably. Instead, I just walk up to the tanks <laughs> and I, I, I attach a balloon to it and it's just out of there and everyone's just trying to collect their senses to figure out what the <laughs> hell's going on and I'm already out of there and it's in the sky and Miller's talking about like, oh yeah, well, we got that thing. <laughs> Um, but Tim, I've heard, I've heard this. I don't know if it's true, but I heard that that's not actually how the Fulton delivery system works. <laughs> in real life? No, it turns out. I think that the actual thing from the 50s uh, or 60s or whatever was like the balloon would attach. There'd be a ring on it so that a jet would actually time it so that this yeah. like thing, like this sort of like... It's like a V. Like a, yeah, thing. it would grab it and, and take it off, but it's mostly like a Like in uh, Dark Knight, kind of, when they're in China? Oh, that's been a while since I watched Dark Knight, okay. but that sounds close. I'll take your word for it. That sounds like a, <laughs> a thing. But you said that you had an interesting interaction with like grabbing the vehicle where they kept shooting it down. Oh, yeah. It was like on purpose. There was a like a tank, and there were a couple of guys on the other side of it, and I would um, Fulton the tank, and it would like start going up, and they would in turn see it and shoot the balloon. You got smart guys you're dealing with now. Smarter guys, yeah. They were yeah. wearing helmets and all that uh-huh. jazz. Um, but then when it was lifted up and they were focused on that, I could take pot shots at them. And then it'd drop. Then it would drop, and then it would lift again, and I could get another guy because the cover they were behind was gone. They were distracted. Eventually, they're all asleep, and then send the tank up my way, and then Fulton those guys as well. The, the last time we talked about this game, we were talking about how we wanted to be non-lethal all the time because yes. you want to collect everybody. Like, oh, man, I need... Even if you're an E, or if you've got a D, or hopefully a C, mm-hmm. like, you're going to be good for Mother Base, and you're going to help me R&D so I can finally get that sniper rifle with a silencer on it or whatever you were aiming for. Now, and, like, we were priding ourselves, like, oh, yeah, non-lethal gameplay. Like, yep. man, this is cool. Like, it's the best. What, what, a, what a contrast to, to shooting everybody in the head all the time. Now I've gotten to a point where, like... Mother base is looking pretty good. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of guys that are pretty some A's. And I got a lot of E's and D's that are holding me back. <laughs> and now it's just like I will do everything. I got a. I was able to now customize weapons and put a silencer on. I suppress my sniper rifle that has tranks in it. Yes. So I'll fantastic. scout out a, a, a place and switch over to that. Put one to sleep and then just walk, roll up there and just straight up murder everybody else <laughs> that is not useful to mother base at all oh god just yeah i don't know are you still going non-lethal i'm still going non-lethal. oh boy i got um i'm a monster <laughs> see i was like quiet say what you will about the way she looks you know whatever but she is the best buddy by far like she's the, the d-dog guy the sniper i used to be a d-dog guy big time but quiet has you guys know the different uh quiet's the sniper one d-dog yeah. is like he marks all enemies mm-hmm. all the time so does even she. the targets if you send her out to scout you gotta a tell place. her to do it though Eh, big deal. It's super easy. And then I, you give her the silenced tranquilizer mm-hmm. gun, and then you say, hey, cover me. And at that point, she just goes, uh, okay, I will put everyone to sleep for you. So you just sit there she and She doesn't say wait. that, though. Just no, she's, she's, quiet. she's quiet. She's very quiet. Yeah, yeah except for the humming <laughs> that she just does not say. Yeah. But, so you could just be totally lazy and watch her do all the work for she's you. She's like... Just the, basically, your priority is like, oh, man, how am I going to Fulton all these guys? That guy's over there. Should I go here first? That's what the decisions become. It's really, uh, she seems great. I got to give her another shot because I was used to having D-Dog who, like I said, like you walk into an area and he'll just go. Ruff, yep. ruff, ruff. <laughs> and then every single time he's marking a dude on your map. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I don't have to worry about marking anything. And then the first mission out with quiet, I'm just like, oh, where's that uh, heavy infantry unit? I'll find them. So dudes with like rocket launchers and stuff. I'm just like sprinting up this cliff and just run right into the line of sight of one of them. And I realize that, oh my God, D-Dog's not with me. I have quiet. Mm-hmm. And I just immediately get a rocket launcher to the face. <laughs> and that's my that's my punishment. So I have a rough relationship with quiet so far, but I got to give her another shot. Yeah. Um, Wade and Andy, do you think that you can peel yourselves away from Destiny in order to, to give this game a shot? Do you Do you care? <laughs> Well, I think both of us are sleep deprived from our Taken King experience so far. That's true. So catch up on sleep for me, but I don't know if I can Getting step away. Size yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I tried it pre E3. I mean, I might revisit it. I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't have like, I mean, I, I liked, I mean, I actually liked, I mean, there's things I thought about that game, at least from my playthrough and you guys know more than I do that reminded me some of, of destiny and like the design and that like. 
you know, you go you go to your base or the tower, mm -hmm. you know what yeah. I mean? And you go back out and you do a mission in a familiar place that you've been to before. Right. And it's just how you approach it and what mission you're doing there is, is kind of the goal, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I, you know, one of the things I, I like stealth um, to a degree, right? And then I also hate... Which was the thing about Metal Gear that kind of always just kind of drives me crazy is that, like, I feel like I'm doing everything fine and everything's going and then just something stupid goes wrong and it and it blows my stealth. Right. Yeah. And then it's like, OK, well, I can shoot everybody and I can shoot everybody and get out and be fine and like complete the mission. But it still gnaws at my OCD on the inside. Where it's like I want that to be perfect. Yeah. Like and it and it, and it bothers me. But I think the really. open world really helps with that just because you can just. You have to let go because nothing's going to be perfect in the open. Because, I mean, it's not like mission-based necessarily in that same way. I mean, you can replay missions. But just if you're just roaming around and, and things go south, you can just run away. Run away. And it's yeah. fantastic. But, yeah, and, but, I mean, that was the thing that bugged me, too, is, like, I walked away from a thing where I could kill a bunch of guys. And I was like, oh, I forgot to pick that thing up and turned around. And they were all standing up again. And I was like, I had to do the whole thing again to go get the thing I had forgotten. Hmm. And I was like, okay, uh... I don't want to go through all that again, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I just, I need to get more comfortable with how I want to play that game. Mm -hmm. But right. it certainly doesn't, it doesn't, it, it just, I, I don't know. I don't feel like it's a, I want a stealth in a Metal Gear game. Right. And it feels like it, I'd probably have more fun if I ran around and shoot things. But I probably don't shoot things. It's probably not as fun as shooting things in Destiny. And then, sure, blah, 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 I, you know. I can see the thought process unfolding itself. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm a pretty simple guy. You know, when it comes down to it, if you if you get a chance to, to, to sit down with it, or, or, or I know you will, but, you know, run around with your tranquilizer, put some people to sleep, steal them with balloons, lots of balloon kidnapping, and then building out Mother Base, and maybe that... That gameplay loop, similar to like Destiny, we were talking about, where it's yeah. like, ah, oh, I went to Mother Base, I can do this stuff now. I want to get back out there and test it out. Um, that that gameplay loop is super, super uh, satisfying. Yeah, I have a feeling that come November, I'm gonna have to play it because we're gonna be doing Game of the Year awards, mm, right. and like all you Metal Gear fans <laughs> are gonna be like, oh, it's Game of the Year, it's Game of the Year, and I'm gonna be able to have to, I have to argue with you about it. Yeah, because I mean, like contenders so far are like Bloodborne, like the easy contenders are Bloodborne and Witcher, um, yep. Batman. Uh, and now we got Metal Gear, and I don't know. Well, it's the the. I mean, we feel Fallout will probably be a contender. That's right. That's, that's I mean, Fallout those is are the coming big ones. down. Yeah. You know, there's going to be a Halo. There's going to be a Tomb Raider. I mean, there were a lot of people that 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 wanted Tomb Raider, the original that's right. to win Game of the yeah. Year. Uh, so I have a feeling that Rise of the Tomb Raider will probably get some votes. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't stink, by the way, we're assuming these games don't stink. By the way, we don't. For we, sure. don't we, we don't. We won't know. There's a bit of a legacy there. Yeah, I mean, we don't know if a game is good or bad. Right. I mean, we assume Fallout's good because. The developer is has been amazing, right? Yeah. So we think that they'll probably do a pretty good job. Um, and same with Crystal Dynamics with mm -hmm. Tomb Raider and Bungie. Uh, I'm sorry, 343, obviously, with Halo. So, um, you know, those are all things that probably end up being contenders in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form as we get that way. But along the same lines, you know, Adeo Kojima's, <laughs> he's pretty famous. What right. do you know? You know what I mean? And, like, people love his game. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not shocking that he's a contender either. It, yeah. It'll be a weird thing because, you know, it's like, oh, it seems like it's going to be a close fight. It's going to be a tough game of the year conversation. But, yeah, there's still unknowns. You know, Fallout 4 can come out and maybe mercifully make it like, you guys, this is not an argument at all. This game is amazing. Uh, and I've never fallen through loved. the geometry in next gen. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me clip Ooh, through this. I'm, stone, hey, I'm stone cold. <laughs> stone cold. Wow, I tried hey, to go up that hill, yeah, and now yeah, there you go. Let's remember that that uh, I mean, Skyrim won Games of the Year. I mean, even from like PlayStation only magazines or PlayStation only websites. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. Do you know what I mean? That's Backwards how much. I mean, that's how much people loved Skyrim. Which is like this whole game is broken. Mm -hmm. And yep. Ambition, man. Yeah, it's just people have fun with the world. You know what I mean? I there. do too, so. but man, save often. That's, almost, that's true. <laughs> Remember, folks, save often. Save uh, often. Also, um, so stick around. We're going to come back after a quick break here and answer some emails. So, yeah, stay tuned. Welcome back to the Game Informer show. So we're going to answer some emails here. Uh if you're ever curious about our perspective on something or want to pitch a hypothetical to us or something along those lines, you can send us an email at podcast at gameinformer.com. Uh, every week, uh, we read a selection of our favorites. We also choose our favorite um, and send a little thank you uh, in the mail. Um, so, yeah, that's podcast at gameinformer.com. Um, so let's kick things right off here. Um, let's go with uh, – this is Javish from West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, 
Hello, guys. I'm a new listener and instant fan. As many of us do, I dream about winning the lottery. However, I don't dream about buying exotic cars or traveling the world. Uh, being the gaming fan that I am, I often dream about being able to finance the creation of amazing gaming experiences tailored to my liking. My question is, if I was a millionaire to give you a number, let's say I had almost a billion dollars, could I call Ubisoft and tell them that I want the next Far Cry game to be based on the Wild West or call from software and tell them I would help finance more expansions for the Souls games, including Bloodborne? I don't expect you to know the exact answer to my question, but I believe it would be a fun topic to discuss. Uh, thanks for making my work days go by quicker, Javish. So the question is essentially like, <laughs> can you buy anything? Does everything have a price? Do you think... Is this like a 10 some, DBS situation? Might have, it reminded me of like, of like Notch and talking about like, I would personally finance Psychonauts 2. Like, mm. do you think if you followed through with that, like that would actually happen? Just one bankroll? Why, why, why wouldn't it? I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd... I mean, I think it's like anything. I mean, they're they're saying like, hey, I'm selling. I mean, they're making products that they sell. If someone walked up and said, hey, how many, you're not going to make any more Far Cries. How many units would you need to sell for you to make another Far Cry? And they'd be like, ah, we need to sell 4 million units. Sold. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do hear about like, you know, someone coming in at the last minute and a secret investor uh, in certain cases. It may not be billions, but like. We, we, I feel like we hear things like that. Wasn't there something with... Uh, you mean on Kickstarters? Yeah, Kickstarters, mm. that sort of thing happens. Yeah, there's been a lot of manipulation of like yeah. dollars and like, you know, I feel to some degree the consumer in that space. But ultimately, people are getting the games they want and that's what matters. But yeah, if you were super rich, I mean, they'll take your money. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, you, I mean, even if you didn't, even if you couldn't buy Far Cry or get Ubisoft to do it, there are a lot of developers out there that if you said, hey, I want to make a Far Cry ripoff that goes here... Uh, can I hire you all to go make it? They'd be like, yeah. <laughs> but the obvious one, before we go to the Wild West, we need to Far Cry with dinosaurs, right? I mean, that's the obvious. Because otherwise oh, yeah. it'd just be Call of Juarez, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, or, yeah, Carl, 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 Carl Juarez. Juarez. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carl Juarez. Uh, <laughs> He's a great guy. Yeah. So, all right. The next one's from Bob here. Um, hello, podcast. Insert pleasantries here. Um I guess I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been a subscriber to the magazine since about issue 55 and love the, the product along for the whole ride. Uh, but for all these years, I've been saving pretty much every issue after finishing through it. These magazines are far from mint condition. Most old issues torn, missing pages or covers or whatever. But my first question for you folks is what should I do with them? They're taking up a sizable chunk of my apartment, stored away in a plastic tub. I need to find a creative way to get them out of there so I don't have the heart to dispose of them. Uh, anyone have any creative solutions or ideas uh, and what I can do with the 17 years of old game informers, Bob from Union, New Jersey. Hmm. Use them to build a paper mache Tim Turry. Oh my God. <laughs> that you could life size yeah. in your home. There you go. Oh my God. That's a really wow. smart idea. So like, because <laughs> uh, like I actually had this really dumb idea of like, if I was rich, so let's say I was like the um, Javish and I, I won the lottery or whatever and had billions of dollars. Like, Making a perfect gold statue of yourself right by your door that's just going like this, so you this can is hang. This what dictators do before everyone kills them, by <laughs> the way. So, just so, you know. <laughs> so you can hang your coat on your own self, and it's ready to like at your service, me. Uh, but <laughs> made then, of solid gold. Exactly. I mean, that's. I mean, that's, you're on your own on this one. That's fine. Paper mache will do until I win the lottery, I guess. Uh, I was gonna say like I've seen people send in uh, like I made a coffee table out of my old game oh, yeah. from issues and or a quilt. Put, Mm, I don't no. know. It'd be yeah. crinkly, I yeah. think. Yeah, I don't know how, how that would go. But uh, yeah, the, the coffee table idea came to mind or framing your favorite issues and stuff like that or, mm. you know, uh, get your favorite issue and, and uh, you know, track one of us down in a trade show or something and, and we'll, we'll sign it and make it worth just billions. Yeah. <laughs> just, when was issue 55, billions. by the way? How long ago was that? I don't know. A long time ago? <laughs> it's probably on the shelf here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's probably a ways back. All right. So next one is from uh, Mr. Kelly. So I guess my fifth grade math teacher is uh, writing into <laughs> us. It's just Mr. Kelly. All right. Uh, so hello, GI podcast crew. I love the show and the new longer format. I've always loved when Tim Turry was on. Ma oh, this is this <laughs> insert pleasantries here. A ben, lot about Tim Ben is Turry. great. I, guess I, I just Hanson's started reading. It. Not here. Ben's like, well, I know what the subject of this episode oh is. Oh boy. It's the Tim uh, show. I just started reading it on autopilot. Uh, so. <laughs> There are a few game series that I could just never. There are a few game series I could just never get into that everyone else loves, and I feel like I should too. My most shameful, I think, is Bioshock. Uh, when it came out, all my friends were telling me I had to play it, so I bought it. After just a couple hours, I quit. Uh, I just did not enjoy the gameplay, even though the story was interesting. Um, I couldn't get through it. The Bioshock 
then Bioshock Infinite went free on Games with Gold, so I played that, but still have not finished it and did not make it very far. Um, it is not that I do not like first-person shooter games because I really enjoyed Borderlands, Mass Effect. Well, that's not a first-person shooter, um, but I get what you're saying. Destiny, Halo, and others. Um, question. Are there any games or series you feel you should like or want to like, but just can't get into them for some reason? Um, thanks to keep the podcast coming. Uh, this is a question we get like on occasion. I think we've gotten versions of this since, but since you know we had you, Andy, and and Wade, and mm-hmm. I, I wanted to get some other perspectives on it. Um, just stuff that everyone seems bonkers over, and you can't get it. Um, Final Fantasy, I've never really gotten into. Okay, which is weird because it's like one of the most beloved series of all time, and they're all so different. Or yeah. a lot of them are different, mm-hmm. so it's like there's a lot of different entry points. But like I remember when Ten came out, I remember absolutely loving the look of it and how cinematic it was for the time. But despite how much I love the look and style of Final Fantasy, just could never get into it. No. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's probably a point of shame for me because I think it just looks like an amazing series. And 10 is probably like, if you couldn't get into 10, as far as like a turn-based Final Fantasy game, that's probably like one of the more accessible and yeah. fun. And, yeah. Exactly. Um, um, so, yeah, it's okay. fine. I mean, I think for me, there's, I mean, there's plenty of series I don't play. You know what I mean? I, I think I generally can can understand why people people like them, but also too, I'm just comfortable with the gamer that I am. I mean, I've played. I mean, I don't even know how many games I've played in my life. I mean, I've played so many, so many games that like, I like what I like. You know what I mean? Like, I I I, uh, I know who I am. I know what I like, and I don't think anyone, including this reader, should ever feel bad that they don't like you know, Bioshock. Right. You know, I love Bioshock. You know what I mean? And I would certainly recommend it to people, but I think always get the games that you like, you know, go with the styles that that you really enjoy. I mean, I will say there's things like I really enjoy Starcraft, but I'm bad at it. Right. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And like people who really get into like the, like, like the multiplayer of that, I'm like, that's really cool. And I like watching it, but I, I'm, bad like i can't do it like i i just simply can't play it people go oh andy you i had a guy a buddy of mine was really good he's like hey Andy, you cannot be that bad let's team up <laughs> we'll go in there we'll play some multiplayer we're gonna we're gonna kick some butt it's gonna be great we started playing because you are that bad i am never playing <laughs> it's with like you someone again. wants to invite yeah. you to dance and they're yeah, like yeah. come on no how bad can it be come on get on the dance floor with me come on <laughs> yeah. it's just like oh god oh no my feet are bleeding I didn't punch right now <laughs> are you good at certain parts because can you like macro can you micro can you just do I, like economics I, yeah yeah I, can, I mean i can i can i can i you know i i, I like instantly i was playing uh, i was playing uh trying preparing for, for the new the new uh void coming out yeah uh and i you know i I, you know, I've got the like muscle memory. I immediately like group and, and, and send those groups and all that stuff is there. I don't know why I'm so bad, but like, <laughs> I, you know, like, you know, I'd be playing with friends and we'd be doing like a three, like a th- like three base map or whatever. And like, he would have like tanks rolling out and killing people. And I'd be like, I just got everything set up to get the mining going. <laughs> but and it's- now with Archon mode, you could team up with somebody on the same like army. You, That's you know, true. you sound like my friends who really want to get me into this. <laughs> And then see me do it and realize it okay. is a bad idea. Okay. I'll I mean, take your I, word for it. But once again, I know who I am. I, it's okay. I play, you know, I play StarCraft on easy, you mm-hmm. know, or, or usually I play on normal and it's not too bad. But when it does get hard, I, I have no problem with, with scaling it back. And just, mm-hmm. I just want to get through it. I enjoy the world. I enjoy the story. Um, you know, I'm, I've been playing, I've been trying to get better at, at uh, Dota 2. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bad. Like there's no there's no like if ands or buts. I'm bad. I mean it's uh, just it's a professional sport. Yeah, it is. But I mean I love I love watching the game and I, and I love things about it and that's okay. It's, it's just okay. I'm just saying there's it's okay to be comfortable with things you don't like. I it's I true. know people are like, you know Joe and I argue all the time about Metal Gear and like I I love Metal Gear One. I love Metal Gear Two. I played the originals. I was like you don't even know what a crazy fan I was mm-hmm. of the NES games back in the day. I uh, you know um I. Three got ridiculous, in my opinion, and I know everyone says that's the best one. I finished four. I mean, I, I basically sat at home and finished four in like, I mean, 48 hours. I, I plowed right through it. Um, I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was the greatest thing ever, you know, um, but I did I did enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, like, I, I'm not I'm not like super sold on five. I'm not like super hype on five. And I know everyone is super hype on five. Right. And I think it's like the highest rated Metacritic game of the year. And Andy, 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 Metal Gear 5. <laughs> and I'm just like yeah i'll get there right you know so and that's okay that's just how it goes sometimes. that's how it goes mm-hmm. yeah how about you jeff well i feel like andy gave us the post credits moral of the story <laughs> early so now i'm gonna feel like a huge heel but uncharted for me okay. is like the series that i watch and like it and uh 
Sony's event where there's you know the unveiling of Uncharted Three, and they're showing you know, Nathan Drake scaling up that mountain, and everyone's like crying tears of anticipation, and I'm just like, this looks so boring and tedious. <laughs> Climbing up here and holding right to jump from ledge to ledge. I don't think that character is interesting. I don't think it's like it's nothing that I didn't see in movies that were right. clearly the inspiration for it and games that were inspired that gameplay. I just don't. I, I can, don't. That's one that I have a hard time understanding why people are super into it. But I know whatever. that you've played the games and you've enjoyed them. They're all right. Right. I mean, but, but it's but just, like that level of enthusiasm over them. Like, yeah. And like, oh, God, there's like in the new one, there's 800 fr- like different animations for right. picking up your ammunition. And like, oh, it's amazing. It's eh, whatever. I can I can I understand where you're coming from, because like I do really like the Uncharted games. But like the fervor around four has been sort or of four. Like, I'm sorry. That's yeah, there's there's about. something kind of alienating about like, oh, man, like I think this looks cool. I'm excited to play this. But yeah. like there's people that can are like falling over themselves ready to play this and like. I guess I'll just move out of the way, let them go to the front of the line, and I'll I'll, I'll wait my yeah. turn. I might give it another shot with the the collection too. Yeah, because that makes it a lot easier to go back sure. to it. You know, if I could just play it on my PS4. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, with Uncharted, it's never been about the gameplay specifically. The shooting's yeah. okay, but yeah, uh, yeah. I think. But you I know, feel validated though. I don't have to like it <laughs> if I don't like it. It's okay, and I like that. I like that Andy said. You that. make me sound like a drip. <laughs> a drip. <laughs> That's I think my you favorite. just made yourself sound yeah. like a drip. <laughs> uh, I, I like that Andy said that because you know it's important to be comfortable with like what you like and what like, what you like is what you like. That's just how it shakes out. But being open to going back to things that you mm-hmm. didn't like before, like the last year and some change, like I've talked about a little bit before, has been really uplifting. Where it's like, oh man, like I didn't think I liked Monster Hunter, but then I got around and gave Monster Hunter another try after after trying with try uh, Monster Hunter three or whatever uh and i'm like oh man it really took this time around and like oh man i'm like over like 70 hours into this and like i know that's a drop in the bucket compared to the hundreds of hours that people play monster hunter or or dark souls 2 coming back to that series Mm -hmm. and and falling in love with it or um street fighter finally starting to understand like oh i I get why people like this now i think with me one is and i have gone to heroes of the storm and i have played league of legends and stuff and i am very open to getting the hooks in me if if a moba can um but like some people, you know, either you're willing to put the time into figuring out what's redeemable about it and what is really great about it, or you're just going to continue to be a little confused, mm-hmm. um, but kind of fascinated. Yeah. And I'm fascinated by MOAs. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that was actually a, a great question. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more here, I think. This one's oh, kind of goofy. Do that? What's that? Can we do one and a half? Can we do that one question that I really liked the last one? Was it the last the op- question? The super open-ended one. That's oh, like, Jeff, Jeff gets to cheat. All right, yeah. He gets to see I get to, I get to pick him. So I, asked, I asked Jeff uh, for some help. Um, it, was a, it was a tight one for me today, and he, yeah. uh, and he came in at the buzzer. So I don't take responsibility for any of these emails, <laughs> especially not this last one, but I think it's kind of great. Uh, Jonathan asks, my question is pretty simple. What's the coolest thing you've ever seen or done? <laughs> That's Jeff Cork's favorite <laughs> that's, question. That's so good. It really <laughs> makes you think. Because like, I uh, like, you go, oh, it's easy. It's ooh. birth of my child. Yeah. No, I was talking to Kyle. Why do you keep looking at me? I, you, it's your favorite question. You should answer. I don't have an answer. What? What did you do? Huh? You set us up for that? You asked, you have me ask a question. You don't even have anything? <laughs> I can tell you what's not the coolest thing in the world, Jeff Cork. You might be directly involved with it right now. Jeez Louise. Jeez oh Pete. Uh, all right. Well, Jeez, oh Pete. <laughs> that's Dan Tack. That's a Dan Tackism. He's he's the big ah, fan. Geez. He wants to bring Jeez oh Pete around. Jeez oh Pete. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 uh, a half. I think question. I love yeah, that half. question though because it's just it's so <laughs> absurd. Like, I I think I'm gonna give it to <laughs> I'm gonna give it to Mr. Kelly. Uh, the question of the week goes to Mr. Kelly who asked about. Um, long division mm-hmm. and and how uh how i feel about long division and, and fractions now this show's kidding. confusing me i thought we had one and a half more questions <laughs> yeah, are we yeah. only just doing the half question do you want do you want one more yeah we can give you one more that other, yeah what's the okay a real question all right so basically very hard. this one's really goofy all right so uh this one's from dustin hey guys love the show yeah we can't end it on that note are you kidding the <laughs> what's the coolest thing you've seen or done what do you I think really it's a work. good question but I, 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 I never mind forget it let's it's move on ask, what's your favorite hey guys love the show <laughs> I was thinking the other day, if they sculpted a Rushmore-like tribute to developers, who would you have on it? I would have Miyamoto on Washington. Mm-hmm. This is them saying it. I don't just have it off the top of my head. <laughs> Sakaguchi as Jefferson, Kojima as Roosevelt, and Ueda as Lincoln. So um, I might like Japanese games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking. 
And I would add Miyazaki as an unf- unfinished crazy horse as well. So it's like sort of, <laughs> I don't know if that's, a, that's, if, that's if that's good or not. <laughs> uh, so picking them was harder than I thought, but I went off games in my life that made me a gamer today and their creators. Thanks, Dustin from North Dakota. Yes, we have technology. What? Yes, that's true. So North Dakota. So the bias is showing here, right? That's mm. is, is that a South Dakota? Thing? It's South Dakota. Don't worry about it. We'll get that in post. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, obviously, like that's that is all uh, developers from Japan. Mm-hmm. If you were going to open it up to, um, I don't know, would would Bushnell be on it? Would you would you give one to, to Nolan Bushnell? Mm. Al Al Alcorn. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Ralph Bear. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, you know, you can start I mean, another like, mountain. Well, I'm just saying that, like, I mean, I, I, I look at those guys as, like, you know, really, like, you know, those guys start. I mean, I think Miyamoto certainly, yes, I, yeah. I think, I think he, he probably should be on there, right? Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't think there's there's any doubt about that. Like David Crane, uh, for me personally? <laughs> I mean, yeah, seriously. Uh, really? Okay, yeah. sorry. I, the heavy rain. Uh, so I love heavy rain, but it was. The, no, no, yeah, that's I, David no, he Cage. Means, like, oh, I'm talking, God, like, yeah, yeah. he's Activision talking old school. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, David Crane. Absolutely. Pitfall. Yes. Okay. David Crane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, I, you know, I, and I guess I kind of like, I like to think of like the, the, the people that innovated like in the early days that mm-hmm. kind of built mm-hmm. the industry, you know what I mean? Kind of built that whole thing up or, or had a major change, which, you know, I, I think N- Nintendo in 1985 got us where we are today by, you know, the video yeah. game crash in 83, uh, was the end of it. So, um, that's probably why I don't want to put anyone who's like like ran the business at Atari anywhere because they ran it in the ground. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know who my 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 fourth pick would be there. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough question. Um, gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I have another one. Maybe I feel like I would want to have a, a composer in there somewhere, just personally. Like I guess, but then again, you get like end up with like Miyamoto and Koji Kondo on there, and it's just like yeah. Mount Nintendo, um, <laughs> which you very well could do. You could easily do that. Yeah. You could easily do that. My picks would all be too modern for you guys. It'd be like Ken Levine and, well, Marty O'Donnell for composers. Sure. <laughs> sure. He's yeah. fantastic. It's it's a tough one. And also, I just don't I think I personally have the time to chisel a mountain into a statue <laughs> at all. So. You could, hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. That guy was looking for something to do with his with his old magazines, Paper Mache. Oh, oh my God. Oh. A Mount Rushmore. A Mount Rushmore of That's the greatest really game developers ever. That's great. Yeah. And then turn it into a weaponized uh, platform <laughs> for nuclear warheads and have it come out of the ocean and at the end of Metal Gear You just Gear have to ruin 4. everything. You oh just boy. have to ruin everything. Including, we had something special there. <laughs> which is what you've been saying about the Game Informer Show podcast all these <laughs> these episodes. So yeah. thank you for coming on and, yes. and, and firsthand uh, exclaiming that. So that, that was fun. Uh, I like the Mount Rushmore of anything question. Yeah. Um, it's a good one. But So if you have questions for us and you want to send an email at any point, it's podcast at GameInformer.com. I think this week, yeah, we're going to give it to Mr. Kelly who, who wrote in about uh, just sort of that game that you just don't get. Like, he couldn't get Bioshock. I thought that was a, that was a good question. But um, that will do it for the first two segments here. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to follow it up. Stay tuned with a, uh, with, a, with a chat with Mike Drucker to learn about Nintendo Treehouse and, um, you know, his, his sort of comedic take on it and sort of... You know, how he landed at uh, Nintendo from becoming a sort of aspiring comedian. It's an interesting tale. So thanks for, uh, for, thanks for listening. Stay tuned. And thanks, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Mike Drucker, thank you so much for joining us on the Game Informer Show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So you have one of the most rare positions in the entire world because you've had a total of three dream jobs at this point okay if you factor it in mike you should be the happiest man on earth because you got you went to ign right so writing about video games it's pretty good and then you went to nintendo to write video games themselves well the other order i went to nintendo then i went to ign okay got it and then you moved on to work with jimmy fallon and eventually the tonight show right yeah it is insane you've covered so much ground well, thank you. Thank do you. you. Do, yeah. Do you feel accomplished at this point? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've definitely liked all three jobs, and I like my current job. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, I'm always so focused on what I'm doing at the time that sometimes, like, I don't, I don't have the luxury to sort of sit and bask in what I've done. All right, well, that's what this podcast is for, Mike. We're just going to sit back <laughs> and just bask the bejesus out of you. Right, right. So setting up, do you want to just talk a little bit about your time at Nintendo? Like what era you went there, what your responsibilities were, everything like that? 
Sure. I was hired at Nintendo in uh, 2010, I want to say. Yeah, 2010 I was hired there. Okay. I was hired uh, for the Treehouse and Localization. So I was a localization writer, editor. Okay. And mm, I was initially hired because they were looking for someone who could, you know, I was already doing stand-up, and I was friends with another localization editor there who had used to be a stand-up in New York, who's still there, um, a really, really funny guy named Ed Murray, who's a great localization writer. And he recommended me for a job, so I, I applied and sent in some writing samples and interviewed and, and got it. That, I love um, that overlap of stand-up comedy and Nintendo. Are there a lot of comedians inside the localization team? There's, a, I think there's, I think uh, now there's actually more than when I was there. Uh, though I'm not sure of that. There were a couple when I was there. I think it's just a thing of like, you know, you have the nice thing at least about Nintendo's localization department is they have a few people who are like, you know, who you know are like screenwriters or have written like fantasy novels and like funny people. Like, I think that what they wanted to avoid was having just one crop of the same people. Okay. Right. Um, whether or not, again, that could just be my interpretation of it. Obviously, I, d I don't speak for Nintendo and sure. never spoke for Nintendo. But um, I think that they really tried to have a diverse group of people so it wasn't just like, you know, fantasy fans and fantasy fans and fantasy fans or like sarcastic nerd, sarcastic nerd, sarcastic nerd. Like, they wanted to have a group of people who could be like, I think that this situation would play out this way. Right, right. What were you working on? What was the biggest shock to the system that you encountered? Um, the biggest project I worked on was I was uh, I worked on Kid Icarus Uprising for okay. 3DS. So I was the uh, secondary lead on that. So there were two writers on it. There was one person who was sort of the senior writer who did a lot of stuff, and I sort of and I helped her out, and I, you know, did a lot of the item descriptions and the funny entries and you know punch up on jokes in it. I also did the Mario 25th anniversary thing. Which wasn't really a lot of localizing, but it was like, like there had been no official names for music tracks for Mario before we did that collection. So you're oh, talking about like the you... Mario All Stars collection? The, remember the Mario All Stars collection yes. for the Wii? Yeah, I was yeah. holding it in my hand earlier this week. Like I was really? looking at that thing. Yeah, we, I yeah. thought that I thought the Super Mario World was in it, and we needed it. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. Nope. 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 Not so much. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah, so you did writing for for that that sort of uh, repackaged uh, All Stars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But let's really break this down. Hang on. So there yeah. were no music track names. Is it just a team sitting around a table then, and they have to come up with the official music track names for the old Mario games? Um, sometimes when we'd write things at Nintendo, it would work that way. Like, it'd be like, okay, here's 50 enemies we need to name, or 50 Animal Crossing items, and you just go one by one in a group with a whiteboard naming things. Uh huh. And, and that's actually a, it's a lot of fun. Um, but for that, it was it was one of those weird things where it had all of those tracks had been named in Japan, and those names had been basically unofficially localized for you know fans doing remixes, fans just doing their own track listings. So we basically took the three or four different varieties that fans had, and then we were like, okay, well, which one makes the most sense? Which one is the most um, you know loyal to the original Japanese? And then we just went with those. I mean, it, it, for me, it was a very, it was a very good training wheels project. You're not localizing dialogue. You're not localizing anything major. But it was like, you know, dealing with Nintendo executives and being like, oh, what if we named it this? And it was, it was very exciting. Do you feel like you could flex your full funny muscle? And I'm sorry, I just said the phrase <laughs> funny muscle. But like, yeah, yeah. Were you, were you kind of having to hold your punches, or did you feel like you were allowed to be as creative and comedic as you wanted to be with those things? Um, with Kid Icarus, it was definitely you got to flex your muscle. Right. Kid Icarus uh, was a, a Sakurai project, yeah, and they were very cool about it. Um, he is he is in in a good way an insane person. Yes, like everything he like he knows like because when I worked, started on the project, there was just a basic structure. There wasn't any game there, and you'd get an email from him where he would say something that was going to happen that would just be in the game a year later. Okay. In, in a way that, like, you know, like, usually when you read game previews, someone's like, all right, this is what's going to happen. And then you get to the final game, and it's kind of like that. Right. It was almost like the game was done in his head. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, he was, and he was that good. Um, but they were very, I think that they were like, we want this to be a funny game. We don't want it to be silly or goof. Like, you know, we want it to be PG-13. Like, you can't just go crazy with it. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. But the amount of freedom they gave us in localization, they were like, we want this to be funny 
in general, you know? So how does it work? Let's, let's explain the process here. So yeah, Sakurai is yeah. directing the project. I assume there's Japanese writers, right? Yes. Okay. Um, actually, I think this one, everything was written by him, although I could be wrong on that. Oh, Holy okay. God. Wow. All right. So then yeah, it comes he over. Is crazy. <laughs> he, he broke his hand. He broke his hand or sprained his hand making the game because he was so into it. It might have something to do wow. with the Kid Icarus controls. I don't remember. <laughs> that. That might also have <laughs> I don't know if it's ever been brought up in your life, Mike, but those controls are terrible. It's, I'm aware of that. Okay. <laughs> it's sad because the game has a lot of charm and a lot to it that's awesome. Oh, yeah. But, um, okay, sorry. So getting back to this process. So yeah. there's a Japanese script. It comes over. Do they do like just a rough literal translation and then you guys and you and the head writer then flower it up? Or how does that work? What The way Nintendo works, and again, different companies do it different ways. Mm -hmm. um, with Nintendo, you get paired with a translator. So both me and my lead both got our own translator. Wow. So like you work with and it's and it's usually um someone who's either, you know, half American, half Japanese, or someone who's lived in Japan a long time, like they're very good. You know what I mean? Like it's sure. nobody it's not like somebody who took like three years of Japan Japanese in college. Okay? Right. Like and you know, it's not just them translating, they'd also do things along the lines. I'm just gonna switch hands really quick. I'm Go really for it. <laughs> um, and if I do this again, I promise I'll do this on a laptop. Um but they would do things like, um, you know, they'd say, okay, well, this this guy or this character or this woman's talking in an accent that would be the equivalent of, like, a Brooklyn accent. You know, that way you okay. can know, like, instead of it just being like, here's a direct translation, it's like, okay, they have a very rough-sounding dialect in Japanese. Okay. And so it's more than just, here is the word, make it grammatically correct. It's, here is the style of what they're saying. How would you make it sound in English? And... and Hang on. So are you sitting in kind of that whiteboard type of room then with the other writer just trying to work Go through ahead. all of these? Uh, not in those situations. And like, well, if with, with enemy names, yeah. You okay. know, with enemy names, it's like, okay, we want to name this like in Japanese. And this is a fake made up example. But in Japanese, its name is like something giant magic turtle. How would we convey that in English in fewer words? But stay loyal okay with dialogue it would be like you just go, i'd go to his desk or he'd come to my desk and we'd go through a cutscene, and he'd be like here's what's happening or you know we'd review a script in our in the system sort of like a spreadsheet you know spreadsheet type thing with right, right. the game script and be like okay here's the dialogue this and this and this and then i'd rewrite it then we'd go over it um and for Kid Icarus, we had like table reads. You know, we had like we would read the dialogue aloud. Oh, fun. It was a, it was a relatively because you know Nintendo doesn't do dialogue games very often. There's a lot it of talking spoke, in that game. Dialogue games. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but pretty much throughout all of Kid Icarus, I mean, there's the chatting back and forth with Palutena and Pit. Like it goes on for a long time. Yes, you know, there's other things in localization, like cultural things that just make sense, that aren't even for characters. You know, like the example that always sticks out for me is like you know in Japan, there'll be high school students with a red band around their arm to mean that they're like the captain of a team. Okay. But when you see it in a Western culture, you're like, oh, that guy looks like a Nazi. Uh, oh, and, wow, yeah. It explains and that's the... that's a very yeah. rudimentary example, but you'd get character designs that aren't offensive or wrong, but you'd be like, okay, someone's going to see that and they're going to interpret it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, could we make him look this way? Because we visually want him to make the, the gamer be like, okay, this character means this. Right. So it's 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 also like cult and there's always the argument and sorry. Oh no! Please go ahead. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. No, no, you're, no, you're great. No. I think it just broke up for a second. Yeah, so. the Skype is oh. uh, having some troubles here too. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. Um, uh, you know, there's always the argument that you know you see on maybe you know forums or GAF that you want to stay true to the artist's vision, but we're you know constantly working with that team. Right. Um. You know, especially in the treehouse. And again, I, I don't speak for Nintendo, but in my experience at Nintendo, mm -hmm. it was a very close working relationship. It wasn't something like, you know, we weren't like, you know, Miramax buying the rights to a foreign movie and then cutting it up a way to mm -hmm. make it work for American audiences. We're like, mm -hmm. okay, we want to do this. And then Japan would be like, well, okay, if you think that's the right way, then you can do that. Or they'd sometimes say, we disagree. Mm -hmm. We'd like you to try a different approach. Yeah. So if you're working with the original creators, it's not like, you know, you just ran with it and did your own thing and took some crazy liberties with it, like some fans might think. Right. Yeah. D exactly. Did you spend a lot of time with Sakurai then? Have you ever met him? I never met him. A lot of emails. Uh, okay. A lot of emails. Um, the fun thing about working with the Japanese company is is there's a lot of emails and there's a lot of pleasantries. 
Okay. Involved in those emails. Um, but just a lot of emails. He never, I don't, I know that uh, um, my lead, you know, did a fair number of calls, did one or two video conferences. And okay. That's about it. Okay. Bizarre. It's so, it was so exciting with Kid Icarus just because Sakurai, he has so much personality just in Smash Brothers alone. Like those games are so funny mm -hmm. and so packed for, full of personality. But then to give him this opportunity to have a story going through and like yes. the story in Kid Icarus is insane. And yes. also like the amount that it'll just break the fourth wall, like showing like the old 8-bit monster designs and stuff like that. It's so much fun to go through. Yeah. Oh, and we were so excited about that. And we totally, totally embraced that. Yeah. Um, and there's one or two like jokes in there that I think that like, you know, we didn't necessarily start, but were something that almost like it was like Japan and America coming up with it together. Like, oh, we should do this, you know, like it's a very collaborative process. I think the, again, Japan, especially with Nintendo being a very, very traditional company that they're always they're, they are always the lead, unless it's a second, you know, second party thing that we're not as involved in. But there's a lot of collaboration. Um, and it's such a company that cares about what it makes. And again, I don't work there anymore. I have to say this. Right. Uh, but like when you're there, you you tell that they really, really care about what they're making. Yeah, there's a reason why there's such a thing as the Nintendo level of polish. It's like you can just right. feel that care and attention that went into oh. this thing. And like so playing few... playing Mario Maker right now is just like yeah. you knew what this could have been in your head, but then there's yeah. always this extra little level that Nintendo applies to it that is just like, well, this is this brought it from great to amazing. Right. I think like yes. they're certainly up there. I think Blizzard is close, maybe for like second. Like who's second in the gaming industry as far as like, uh, level Blizzard's of a really yeah. a really good bet. Yeah. yeah. Right. So Sorry, Mike, I switched hands again. Oh, you're doing fine. So how much <laughs> how much of that process would you say is entertaining versus how much is you beating your head against a wall trying to come up with pun number 300 for an item? It, day to day, it would change. Right. Uh, um, there'd be some days when it's like, you know, I because I was there before the 3DS came out, but it was probably like maybe six months out from being finished. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. And, like, I got to play an early 3DS. Oh, man. And, you know, early, early, very early versions of Mario Kart. And, you know, playing very early versions of Nintendo games is so cool. And so you'd have moments like that where you're like, I'm at Nintendo playing an early version of the game, and I'm being asked to name a Zelda character. Yeah. And, the, I, you know, something I said is now going to be in Zelda, which people take very seriously, which is amazing. But there's also times when you're like... Okay, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Oh, well, okay, like, I didn't love working with, the Nintendo's marketing department's great, but part of the job of localization is, like, talking to advertising people, talking to marketing people. Okay. Saying, okay, this is what the game is, this is who would probably like it. Writing up, you know, basically writing up a summary of what the game is so grown-ups can sell it. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the, like business side of it that I never really loved. And I don't think, I mean, again, I just speak for myself, but I don't think anybody really loves that. No. But, you know, and sometimes it's cool because, you know, like you get to do a demo for Reggie and then you're like, oh, oh shit, I'm doing a demo for Reggie. That's awesome. Um, Is he a human being, by like, the way? God, I'm, I have to do a demo for Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine it'd be stressful. What's, what's the Zelda character that you named? What is that story? I named, uh, in, in Skyward Sword, the character Groose. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Wow. How'd you I come up with Groose? That is my claim to fame. Sorry? <laughs> How'd you come up with Groose? It's so perfect for him. They, uh, well, because in these naming meetings, they'll be like, okay, this is a character. We want him to be, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, okay, he's sort of a jock character. We want him to sort of be like a douchey guy, but we're trying to stick with a bird theme for this game. Oh, oh. And so, like, I went from Bruce to Goose to Groose. Okay. So, sort of like, you know, Bruce that's is sort really, of like, like That's a, like really good. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very. I'm more proud of that than I should be. <laughs> I mean, of of all the newer Zelda characters, I think you know, in the last few years, like I can remember Midna. I can remember Groose. If you had, if you put a yeah. gun to my head and asked me to name other Skyward Sword characters, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I yeah, I could name just Groose. Yeah, that's so good. But I wanted to touch on the pun thing because, like, you know, in some circles, puns are considered this dirty terrible thing and it's like oh mm. god you just screwed up this entire conversation with these puns and stuff but nintendo <laughs> embraces them so you know wholeheartedly uh is that something right. like is did you bring a love for puns you know yeah, over to nintendo oh, and okay 
Definitely, and they encourage it. Yeah, I, I, I like puns. I don't mind puns. Uh, sparingly. Like, I don't okay. want to just do dad jokes, you know. Mm. But, but for games like Animal Crossing, which I did not work on, I wish I did. My greatest regret of leaving Nintendo is not getting to work on an Animal Crossing. Oh, there's so um, much content there. Yeah, but like, you know, like like doing the fish pun, stuff like that. Yeah. That, that is so much fun to do. Those yeah. Cap'n songs. Yeah, especially yes. Cap'n songs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I wanted to touch on, did you uh, have any other, like, puns or names or anything that you wanted to, like that you you look back and just like specifically i'm very proud of this thing um i can't remember it off the top of my head but there's a bunch of nintendo in jokes i snuck into the kid icarus statues okay and they weren't there to begin with oh, and okay. i just remember like like i did like zelda jokes like things that aren't like overt jokes but nice little sort of side jokes that i felt really proud of oh, we'll have to go back through those and with a uh, with yeah, that in mind yeah. Hey, I heard Earth once. Probes, yeah. yeah. Mike, tell me if you have any insight into this. I heard yeah. that, like, clearly with Kid Icarus, it brought over that Smash Brothers UI where it's like the bubbles yeah. all over the place. I heard that that's because Sakurai is married to the UI designer. Literally. Do you know anything uh, about that? Yeah. I mean, like, he is. He. I know that his wife works there, and I know that she has an important role at Sora. I don't know what her job is. I okay. totally forget. I all know right. that because we talked to her. A lot, so you might actually be right. Okay. I just remember there's like 30 people we talked to, so okay. I confuse, like, who did what. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's natural. Can you? Just but ex- his wife definitely works with him very closely, and she's like a very, very big part of the process. You must be very sympathetic, like when those stories would always come out about Sakurai. I feel like every interview he did about Smash Four, he'd always be like, "This is exhausting." Please appreciate yeah. what I'm doing here because I don't know if I can do it again. Again and again, he's had to come back to Smash, and they've they've all been knocked out of the park. But yeah. you must be extra sympathetic being that close with them through those email ch- exchanges and seeing him behind yeah. the scenes a little bit. Well, he cares so much, you know. Uh, and again, there, you know, I'm sure that there are people who don't care as much, even within the company. I haven't met them because, again, I was only there about two years which was time to do. But um, he cares so much that I think like for him, when someone's like, hey, why don't you just add this character into Smash? He's like, okay, well, I need to learn everything about this character. I need to learn how they would move and how they would fit in and what they would sound like. You know what I mean? Like, he's not just like, all right, we'll add him as DLC later and we'll, you know, do it over weekend. Like, he wants to make it as good as possible. And I do think that that probably burns him out. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it, I hope he gets to do something away from Nintendo, as good as that partnership has been. <laughs> like, I hope he gets to branch out with Sora and work with somebody else. It'd be so mm-hmm. nice and kind of fun to see. But can you just explain, yeah. can you explain the treehouse? Like, how many people are working there? What is the localization department like? Um, the It's changed since I've been there. So right. what I'm giving you is, like, you know, 2012 treehouse versus 2015 mm-hmm. um i don't think it's gotten worse or anything i think they've just changed how they do it a little bit when i was there it was um it was us you know some people from the pokemon company and we had our own sort of division of the building like i had a special security guard to get into treehouse like you couldn't bring in guests right it's you know they're very very secure like my you know my wii u and my 3ds test unit at, or my Wii test unit, I didn't have a Wii U test unit because I was before that, mm-hmm. but my Wii test unit, my 3DS test unit, we're both, were literally chained to my desk. Yeah, we have that here as well. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so, it was, you know, so it's, it's, it's legit, but it's also like very laid back. Like everyone else in the building was always wearing business suits and, you know, jeans and t-shirts and trios. Um, mostly it's localization. Mm-hmm. Mostly, at least when I was there, it was localization. It was people translating. There was some marketing. I think there was maybe a little bit of advertising, although I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really like, you know, when I was there, Treehouse was really the people who work on, not not that are the face of the games on the American side, but the people who are the go-to people to understand the games on the American side. Okay. You know, so, you know, other treehouse jobs, like I did one or two radio review or interviews when I was there just to be like, okay, we're, we're putting out this game. I'm going to talk to some guy to talk about Christmas season and what my product is. Okay. Um, so it's, so think of it as both localization, but also the people who actually play the games and understand them. Like everyone at Nintendo loves their games, but you know, the legal team isn't playing every game and giving demos of them at E3. And so treehouse is just one section of the Nintendo headquarters. 
in yeah. Seattle then? That's the whole idea. So is Treehouse 200 people, 1,000 people? Um, when I was there, it again, I could be totally wrong. When I was there, I think it was about maybe 40 to 50 people. I think oh, maybe okay. now it's doubled that size. Why do you think they're so secretive? I think they're so secretive, one, because it's a very traditional company. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I don't know why any game company is that secretive. Um, I, you know what? I honestly don't know. I think it's just being a traditional company. I also think that because, you know, we're a branch of Nintendo, but we are not Nintendo of Japan, that Nintendo of Japan is like, we are in charge. Mm-hmm. We will tell you what to do in a in a in a very paternal way, but at the same time, like, do not do anything without telling us because we are the ones who are running this. Right. Okay. And they mean well. They're not. They were. They were very nice. They were mm -hmm. very cool. They're and it's. I can't stress enough. And this is not me protecting like friends or anything. It is an amazing company to work for. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're like, if you leak anything, you're fired. <laughs> like they're very clear about that. They're like, don't don't mess. That's our. You know. The two things that can get you fired is like leaking something or like aggressively bad HR issues. Right, yeah. right. So, so I'm curious if you follow that whole story about the Treehouse employee that did the podcast a yeah, couple weeks yeah. ago and, and he got let go for that. I wish I could yeah. remember the name of the podcast. Something like Gaming After Hours or something? I think it was, uh, yeah. Like, Anyways, yeah. you can Google it and find it. It's with Nintendo Employee Fired mm -hmm. Podcast on Google. Yeah. But what, do you, what did you think? What was your take on that whole saga? I mean, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Um, did you listen to the episode? I didn't. I, I didn't. Uh, okay. I also didn't know the guy. Right. So I think he started like, after you would have been gone. Yeah. So it's also one of those things where I'm like, you know, I mean, Nintendo doesn't ban people from doing like I did comedy podcasts when I was there. Oh, really? But yeah, I mean, but they were just comedy. Like it was just me as a stand up comedian doing a podcast where we're like we'd make fun of a movie together. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not like their employees can't be on Twitter or can't be on Facebook and can't have lives. I mean, if you look, Nintendo employees are on Twitter all, not all the time, but I mean, like, like they use social media. Yeah. Um, I think it's more like Nintendo doesn't like people talking about Nintendo while they're at Nintendo. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the same for most companies, but I think just yeah. the hammer coming down so hard was a real shock to a lot of people. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the sad thing, too, was like listening to that episode, that guy was such a Nintendo fan. I mean, he's a lot like right. you, Mike. <laughs> it, like, yes, yes, yes. He yes. just raved about Nintendo, defended Nintendo, was trying to defend the Wii U name and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then it's like, well, sorry, you praised Nintendo for an hour in a public channel, you're axed. I think, but I think that it's something you're told about, though. You know, that's, mm -hmm. like, I mean, obviously, you know, on one hand, I, I, I definitely sympathize. And again, I'm not, I don't work for Nintendo, so I have no reason to take Nintendo's Side, but it is something they tell you not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that they're like, don't. And even when I was there, when podcasts were still a re relatively young thing, right? Like, don't do that. Don't do mm -hmm. interviews. You know, if you're going to do talk to media, you have to talk to us first. In fact, when I, um, when I got the job offer from IGN to do videos for them, I told my boss about it right away because I was like, listen, I know there's a conflict of interest. If you need to pull me off anything, let me know. You know, I'm not going to tell them anything, but that's the situation. Um, it's a company that really, really works on trying on like sort of a, a I want to say respect, but that sounds like a cold response to him getting fired, which mm -hmm. I think is an extreme response. Um, but it is a company that's like, please respect us. Please let us know what's happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely. It's a very tight family. It's a very it's a very tight family. And, and you know, again, it's it's it is it's a very small company. You know, it's not Microsoft or Sony. Like, they just make the games. Yeah. No, that was one of the big takeaways from that podcast interview that that guy did is he definitely spun it like they feel like they are the underdogs in this whole situation. We're the scrappy, old-timey family that's been fighting for so long and we're still around. And right. it was kind of a unique perspective. Yeah. It was like, oh, it's people just say the big three, the big three. But right. it seems like Nintendo doesn't have that perspective. Uh, they, uh, When I was there, I mean, I was never part of the business side of things. So there was like one or two like you know, business meetings, like all company meetings you go to where they show you graphs and they're like, this is how sales are. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm terrible at that. So I'd always just be like, yeah, I mean, okay. Terrible at looking at graphs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm terrible at business meetings. Okay. I'm terrible at meetings when there's like 
statistics involved. Like I understand when someone's selling more than other people, but I'm like, who cares? Let's just go make games. <laughs> well, in your case, being a, a super creative, funny guy, it's probably good to be able to just kind of siphon that energy in that direction and not have to worry about right. the other stuff. So, and I will say this, like, and and this probably is me talking out of school slightly, but everyone at Nintendo also plays other games. Right. You know, they own other systems. Like, it's not like, like sometimes, you know, I'll read internet comments and I felt there and I, and I, and I felt it since then where like people are like, oh, Nintendo, you don't know what's going on in the world. It's like, no, everyone, I, you know, maybe not like the cafeteria lady, but almost everyone there loves video games mm -hmm. and not just Nintendo games. You know, I was there when Skyrim came out and that's all we fucking did for a month. <laughs> And I'll add this, um, we would do demos for, for Reggie of other of our competition, of their competition. Oh, like it's, relevant competition or? Yeah, you know, like, because Reggie, Reggie loves games, but he doesn't have time to, like, play Skyrim all the way through. I've seen him play Smash Brothers, I get it. Right, but, <laughs> but you know, like, there would be meetings where it's like, he'd be, be like, okay, what are the big games, right? Would it be like? Now, so I know one of them, you'd explain why people like it. Yeah. Would it be so, re relating so, to like a big product coming out, like Skyward Sword's coming out? What's similar to Skyward Sword? Show us what they're doing. Yes and no. I mean, like it. That would be part of it. Like you, you reference like you'd be like this. You know, we're doing this. This is another thing. But it wasn't just like Skyward Sword's coming out. What's Skyrim? It's like okay, this is a big phenomenon in gaming right now. You might get asked about it mm -hmm. during an interview. So this is what it is, and this is why people like it. Ooh, hang on. Were you there? Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. You, oh, I was just going to ask, were you there during, I mean, your time kind of coincides with the rise of Minecraft. And so being, yeah, yeah, I was there. I, I fucking, am I allowed to swear? I'm so ah, No, but keep doing it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, because I was there, because I used to bring in, I used to have like a little, when I got hired at Nintendo, I bought like a little Alienware, one of, they used to have 11 inch ones. Okay. And, and I bought one as like a treat for myself and I'd bring it in. And someone's like, oh, you got to try out this like alpha of a game you can buy for nine bucks called Minecraft. And I remember watching YouTube videos being like, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I got, got into it and we were really into it. And like, it's funny cause we were very into it. We played it aggressively and we played it for hours and then I got bored of it. And then after I got bored of it, it came out on, like, I think it came out on like the Sony Xperia first or something. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, remember that Sony PlayStation phone? I yeah, mean, you could play Crash Bandicoot. Yes, yes, yeah, I, it was yeah. a weird deal. Absolutely. Is that the Sony Ericsson thing? I don't remember. Maybe, but, yeah, but, yeah. And okay. it came, I think it came out on like that like first, and one of our writers was, was like, hey, check it out. And I was like, this is terrible. Who's going to play this on phones? <laughs> like, always, I could not have been... And the thing is, I paid money for Minecraft. I own... I like had one of the you know early, early accounts, mm -hmm. but I could not have been more wrong about the rise of it. <laughs> so do you think... Did anybody prep Reggie on Minecraft? Because that is an important, oh, yeah. interesting meeting. Oh, um, I mean, I was not there for that, but um, all, but definitely. Okay. Oh, that's fascinating and bizarre. All right, so we've touched yeah. on it a little bit, but what do you think are like the overall secrets to Nintendo's success? Is this the level of polish and care? Is there anything more than that in the process? Um, I think it's it's polish and care. It's also one of Nintendo's advantages is that. And I'm sorry that I keep moving my phone a little bit. <laughs> You're fine. Um, Only people on YouTube care. Um, one, Nintendo did so well early on that it has a lot of money saved up. And these are all pet theories, by sure. the way. These are not like business secrets that they shared us in a doc in like a folder. Look at our secret um, vault of cash, everybody. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I think because they had, they do have so much cash saved up and because they're just a games company, even though they have stockholders, um, they're able to go, we just make games. We have enough money that we can have a few failures and do experiments. And we just make games. You know, so, like, Nintendo doesn't have a TV division that's, like, you know, fizzling out, so they really need to shove out this big game mm -hmm. right now. Okay, right. Yeah. You know, whereas with, I think, other companies, they do have that, where it's like, okay, how is this division going to make us money because this division's not? Or this division's losing money. Well, this division's performing well, so we're going to take away resources unless you turn it around. Nintendo just makes games. Yeah. Um, you know, and you could also say there's merchandising and all that, and obviously that's a part of it, but at the end of the day, you know, Nintendo's revenue never came from, you know, selling microwaves. Right, yeah. So I think that they have the advantage of saying, well, that's our only focus. And, and because they have to fail a little bit, you know, and as much as people can be like, you know, 
wah, I don't like the Wii U or I don't need the gamepad. Mario Maker needs that gamepad. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, because I don't have a vested stake in it anymore, I'm glad that Nintendo went through that process to get Mario Maker. <laughs> right. <laughs> All you the know, Wii U's troubles like, are worth it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and I also think that there is some, you know... Um, and a lot of it is, I think, and again, this is all my opinion. I cannot stress that. Right, enough. we got it. You know, but Mr. Iwata, uh, I think that his, his press pushed a lot of like, all right, let's just try something weird. You know what? They're going to do that. They're going to do a big graphics machine that plays Blu-rays. Let's do this instead. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it paid out and sometimes it didn't. Like, I was not there during the salad days of the Wii, but from what I hear, you know, you know, you read gaming comments, and I feel like the Wii is seen as a failure. Right. You know, whenever I read internet comments about the Wii, it's always like, well, look at those trash games. The Wii made Nintendo a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, it turns out it was a fad. It's like, yeah, it's a fad that brought in the Titanic filled with cash. That was the it, it prints lot. money meme days. Yes, yes, that, definitely. Yeah. In fact, I started when I started Nintendo, they had just opened a new building, and I'm relatively sure that that new building was paid for by the Nintendo Wii. Right. No surprise there. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see it. So, are you still there, Mike? You know, um, they also have, like, a football field that they refuse to call Hyrule. Field. What? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, Hyrule Field would be the perfect <laughs> name for a football game. Yeah, Or a football it? field. What do they call it? They just call it, like, uh, maybe they call it Hyrule Field now. They, they had this cool <laughs> thing where they'd name every conference room after, like, a different Nintendo thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like, there's... There was, they changed it because people didn't like it, but they had a conference room named Eternal Darkness. Oh, wow. Which was the best. Yeah, that's, that's pretty fantastic. good. I think we went to, like, Master Sword. Yeah! Like, Master yeah, yeah. We, my we, HR introduction was. Okay, that's where we interviewed uh, Miyamoto uh, via, like, Skype or something for our... We did a cover of New Super Mario Bros. Wii U and, and stuff like that when the Wii yeah. U was coming out. But, yeah, I remember, yeah. remember Master Sword uh, conference room. Fondly. Yes. So, hey, I have a very specific question for you. Yeah. And But I guess it can kind of be broadened out a little bit. Uh, whose ass do we have to kiss over the writing in the Mario RPG series? Like, who who are the key talent there that can crank out that gold? Um, I would, I you know what, I want to say that it's mostly. I mean, there's a few people. I mean, I know Nate. Um, Nate Bildorf is that Nate Bildorf? Yeah, okay. sorry. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Nate Bildorf did a lot, a lot of those. I know he did the N64 one, and that was sort of like what made his name there in the treehouse. Mm -hmm. And he's so still there. Good. And set a new tone um, for like the sense of humor, I think, for sure. Yeah, that yeah. is carried through today. And probably, I wonder like if Nate didn't write Paper Mario the way he did or localize it the way he did, like would those wacky Nintendo videos exist today? You know, like their E3 press conferences yeah. running down to yeah, the puppets. Yeah. Like how much has it shaped the course of the history yeah. just through Nate's localization? That I don't know, and that I, right. that I definitely can't speak on. Uh, but I do think that the videos are a good move. As someone who was not there when the videos are made, I, I do like the videos and feel like it's a good thing to do in the spirit of Nintendo. We got to talk to Mega64 several episodes back about some of their collaborations and stuff, and it was a really fun perspective on that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we got Nate Bildorf. Who are the other big-timers there that we should really worship? Uh, I feel bad. I feel... Because I, I don't want to, like, exclude anyone or forget anyone. So, sure. Um... Uh, but everyone there is great. I just don't want to. I don't want to forget any names. <laughs> okay, that's totally that I fine. Come off as a villain, but yeah. everyone there is like there was nobody there I disliked. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a truthful thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Bill Trennan's been around for a long time. I imagine Bill Trennan is great. He's on Twitter all the time still. Oh, perfect. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Yeah. When he's not pretending to quit and making everybody light themselves on fire. Oh, Remember yeah. that day? The confusion with the Mega 64 video. Yeah, where like, yep. he posted that before the video went live, and everyone's like, what? Yep. Yeah, like, oh. And Bill can do that. Bill has the power to do that. Bill's also, uh, Bill is also an incredible Japanese translator. Yeah. Yes. Well, he's been seen, Miyamoto's translator for what, like 20 years? Seen it firsthand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, him several and, times. Him and Tim O'Leary are both. I mean, the, mm -hmm. Nintendo has amazing translators overall, but they both have this weird talent of like, like I've seen, uh, I think it was maybe Mr. Iwata was speaking. And Bill was doing something on his iPad related to that presentation while just talking. So he was like, he was auto translating as a human being. <laughs> He's like a Jedi, like a Jedi of yeah. Japanese translation. Okay. And he was making the chair. And it was too. perfect. There was no like, it's not like in a movie where someone talks and pause and someone talks like, it was so as if a water was talking. Bill's like, all right, blah, 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 blah. It was, it's crazy. Man. On the, having, on our jobs, we are on the receiving end of some very good 
uh, translation, some very bad translations. So when folks like Trinan, uh, you know, when you work with them, yeah. it really it really shines. So yeah, definitely. So we should probably move on to your transition. Okay. Do you want to talk about how you arrived working with Jimmy Fallon? That whole thing. Sure. Um, well, this is the so, IGN beat. You know, I think I'm sure? curious what like briefly brought you from Nintendo to IGN, and then that transition to to Fallon. Um, I think that after. Um, I, you know, I did Kidder Chris and I did, uh, I did the localization of Mario Party 9, which was a pretty fun project to do. Huh. Um, Amazing but I think I was, I was a little, I think I was both burnt out and I really liked Nintendo, but stand up was going well and I wanted to sort of explore a slightly more creative side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to write some of my own stuff. Um, and just by chance I got, I happened to got a job offer from IGN to do, they wanted to do funny videos. They, right, made, right. they got a contract from YouTube to do comedy videos. Mm-hmm. Um, so through my manager, I got an interview with that and it, the job offer was good. And I had done some freelance for IGN in the past for a few people like Brian Altano, who's still there. Right. And so I took the job, you know, I, I hadn't lived in San Francisco. I thought I'd give it a shot. So I moved there. And so I worked on that for about a year and that was really fun. I got to work with uh, Greg Miller, Brian Altano, really cool, funny people. Um, I did a mass effect 80s cartoon, which I still think is one of the my favorite things I've written. <laughs> I, I did see that one. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to write. Uh, and then uh, while I was doing while I was there, I got something that's called the Montreal Comedy Festival, which is one of the biggest comedy festivals in the world, and I was one of the new faces. Cool. And every year, that's like that's supposed to be like the you know like here's like the new crop of comedians that you should hire for things. So I did that, and that was also during the 2012 election, and I was tweeting a lot of jokes about the election. And I got noticed by Fallon. I got noticed by the, the the writing staff of Fallon, I should say. And they brought me on. You think it was from retweets? I think it was from retweets. I think it was also from Montreal. A few people there saw me at Montreal. Okay. Uh, one of the writers there I had also worked with as a freelancer at The Onion. So mm. I think I just had a couple... I had a couple good references and a couple good showings a few places. Yeah. So what era of Fallon is this? Is this, I take it, before Tonight Show, right? This is the, it, it was the last year of late night. Okay. So I was there uh, 2013 and that was the final year of late night. And then I was there last year when it became the Tonight Show. Okay. So, I mean, I remember one of the big pitches that was so exciting when he took over late night was that he was talking about how he's going to embrace game development. Like I remember he had yeah. Tim Schafer on and that just yeah. blew my mind. It was yeah. so exciting, exciting to see like a nervous Tim Schafer on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But so they kind of had a gaming initiative before you arrived there. But did you feel like you helped feel that within the company? I mean... They already had people who loved games, and he loved games. Yeah. Um, so they didn't necessarily need me for it. But yeah, definitely. Like, you know, I, I pitched ideas when they did they did a video game intro one of the weeks, and I, you know, kept suggesting different games to pull from, and I, like, worked with the designers a little bit on it. I mean, I definitely don't have full credit for anything like that. Right. But I think that me liking video games helped. That's great. Yeah, I definitely. Think, yeah. And, I mean, I'm trying to think of... Jimmy Fallon, the big gaming things. I remember the GoldenEye thing blew up when he played GoldenEye yeah. with Pierce Brosnan. That's fantastic. That was fun. Yeah. Is it just, I mean, it's just as simple as now all the writers are video game nerds or a majority of them are. And so we've just realized, like grown up to a point where it's like, yeah, we're going to do what we're interested in and we're interested in making Pierce Brosnan play GoldenEye for the N64. Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't who wouldn't want to do that? I, I can't take credit for that. I think that might have even been Jimmy's idea. I'm not sure. Oh, sure. But, you know, yeah. At the same time, there's yeah. the demographic too, right? Like the changing demographic of people who who watch, right? And what's relevant to their interests, I assume that played a part in it as well. Or... Um, I mean, you know, uh, that's definitely like, I mean, I'm sure that's something that's considered, but like for us, it's just like this would be funny to do. That's right. Or this would be fun to do. Like it's never like, you know, and and not to not to disclaimer everything again. I don't speak for for the show, but it's right. never at least. At, you know, as far as I know, it's never been like, we need to get, you know, boys 18 to 34. What do they like? Like, it's never like that. It's like, okay. oh, this would be a fun thing to do. This person's here. This would be a fun thing to do. Let's come up with ideas. That's yeah. good to hear because I think I, I just sort of assume sometimes there's sometimes this cold calculating, you know, efficiency behind things. But it's just refreshing that it's yeah. like, oh, hey, Mike Tyson's going to be around. Let's make him play punch out. Yeah, exactly. Himself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, with the current state of late night, I've seen some people mentioned that like oh it just seems like some late night shows they're just going for you know a big hit on reddit just like a good viral video with something like pierce brosnan playing goldeneye or something like that 
Do you guys have those meetings in there, in the actual writing room, where you just talk about like, oh, this would be good. This is going to be big on the internet as a blown out chunk. Or are you always trying to make somewhat of a cohesive whole? Um, cohesive whole. I mean, there's times when like something will happen during the sh- like watching the show, and I'll be like, oh, that's going to like just as an observation, being like, that might be big online. Right. Um, it's never something that's you know, like, well. It's not not at IGN or or found, but I I've you know done freelance work in the past before even Nintendo. I did freelance work, and then people would be like, "Let's make a viral video." Right. And there's yeah. nothing harder to do than to just make a viral video. Right. Um, and it's never like that. It's never been. It's never been like you know, you know. Obviously, you want to make things that people like. You know, we want to make things that people want to watch. Um, but there's never like, there's never like some sort of effort to like follow, you know. YouTube stars or like do what they're doing or just copy someone else or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what are some of the bits that you're most proud of at Fallon? Um, well, I write mostly monologue. Oh, I've, okay. done, I've had a few thank you notes that I've been really proud of. Uh, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head. I had, I think I had one thank you note that I really, really liked and I liked it cause it really made Steve Higgins laugh and Steve Higgins has been doing comedy forever. So to make <laughs> him laugh is kind of cool. And I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to tell you it and it won't work because I'll butcher it. Okay. Um, but it's something along the lines of like, like, thank you, the story of the ugly duckling for teaching us. It's not what's important. Um, it's not what's on the, sorry. It's not what's on the outside. That's important. It's what's on the outside later in life. <laughs> <laughs> I totally mess it up. That's, that's so really good. good. Yeah. It gets across. It totally works. It gets across. It gets across. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm funnier typing than I am talking. Yeah. I have the exact opposite problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I have the problem where I'm not funny in either. So that's, you really that's rough. I got it. So do you miss the video game world at all, Mike? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I like my current job a lot, and I don't want to leave my current job. And if anyone's watching, I do not want to leave my current <laughs> job. Uh, but yeah, of course, I love video games. I love video games. Um, you know, for, for me, leaving Nintendo was one of the toughest decisions of my life. Because I wanted to work at Nintendo when I was a kid. That's the, I wanted to work at Nintendo or Capcom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And... You know, I still like gush about Nintendo on Twitter uh, and other companies too. Let's let's be clear about that. I've tweeted terrible Metal Gear jokes recently. <laughs> um, I wish we had some know. prepared. Like if someone like if in the future I was in a position where someone was like, "Hey, would you like to work on a game?" and it and I could still do the other stuff I'm doing, I'd be like, "Yeah, I'd love to do that." Mm-hmm. That sounds great. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, hey, we should probably wrap it up here. I think we went a little bit long. Also, okay. please be sure. To, it's not a matter of if, but when you start playing Mario Maker, please share some levels uh, on Twitter. Um, well, I've seen his, his masterwork with the fart and the poop. I did. And, oh, you already have one <laughs> yeah, out? Yeah, oh. he's totally on top of oh, it. Wow. It's, did it's, you get stellar? Okay, yeah. gotcha. What is, what is your Twitter handle, by the way? Uh, Mike Drucker. M-I-K-E-D-R-U-C-K-E-R. That's and easy. you want to recite the Mario Maker code for your favorite uh, <laughs> fart level, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's tattooed. It. <laughs> Crazy. No, but is there anything else you want to plug, Mike? Uh, no, you know, just follow me on Twitter, you know, watch The Tonight Show and play Mario Maker. That's awesome. Cool. Well, most most guests on the Game Informer podcast say watch The Tonight Show at the end, so I guess it's pretty natural. <laughs> but cool. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate going into the deep dive with all the Nintendo stuff. I think yeah. it's a really unique perspective Thanks, that you Mike. have on the whole industry, so I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Cool. And thank you so much for watching or listening to the Game Informer show. Be sure to tune in next week. We'll be here waiting for you. Awesome. Thank Bye. you. Bye.